You are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with Maharashtra Orthopedic Association Masterclass webinars on osteoporosis. To introduce today's topic and the speaker, I hand over to our president, Professor Dr. Ajit Shinde. Friends, I'm traveling to Aurangabad. There may be some problem for connectivity. Respected dignitaries, faculties, and my dear friends, good evening. Greetings from Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Once again, I, Dr. Ajit Shinde, President of MOA and Organizing Chairman of IOCON 2021, Goa, welcome you all in this wonderful masterclass series, which has witnessed great academic discussion and great teachers. Friends, Academic have been always the priority for Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, and our goal is to take the advanced knowledge and skills to utmost peripheral level. From this month, we are having additional goal of making awareness regarding IOCON 2021 Goa and convey its update to every different state of India. Thus, on each Sunday, we are planning to involve another state, and today our guest partner is Tamil Nadu state. I appreciate enthusiasm of President and Secretary of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Dr. Mr. Antony Vimal Raj and Dr. P. T. Sarvanna for accepting our invitation on short notice. Osteoporosis being a silent disease in aging population, leading to many complications like fractures and deformities. Today, we are going to discuss management of osteoporotic, osteoporotic fractures. First topic is common sites of fragility uh, fractures, and faculty speaker is Professor Dr. Sangeet Gawale from Mumbai, who is also president of BOS. Second topic is problems of fixation, problems of fracture fixation in osteoporotic fractures by none other than Professor Dr. G.S. Kulkarni from Miras, senior most teacher who is also chairman of scientific committee IOCON 2021 Goa. Third topic is problems of fitness for surgery in osteoporotic patient by Dr. Balaji Ase Gaunkar, who is leading anesthesiologist. Fourth topic is surgical solution in fragility fracture by Dr. C. Rex from Coimbatore. Fifth topic is problems of fracture healings in osteoporotic bone by Dr. S. Jackie Stricci. Sixth topic is medical solutions to osteoporotic fractures by Professor Dr. N. Thanapan from Madurai, who is also a member of Pediatric Orthopedic Committee of IOA 2021. For today's webinar, we are having coordinators, Dr. Prakash Shigedar, who is past MOA secretary and, pre and present organizing secretary of 37th MOCon 2021 Goa. Dr. Sandeep Piriaris, young dynamic arthroscopic and arthroplasty surgeon from Mumbai, who is EC member of both MOA and BOS, and also joint secretary of Arthroscopic Association of India. Her coordinator is Dr. Abhijit Kale, who is another young dynamic surgeon from Sion, Mumbai. He is also EC member of BOS. Also, we are having my organizing secretary, Dr. Ram Chadda, and two case presenters, Dr. Vigas Agashe and Dr. Govardhan Ingre, who are also going to participate in this webinar. I welcome all of them. I am sure we will have amazing lectures, followed by insightful discussion 
my my best wishes for today's webinar and i am sure all these dignitaries will enlighten us on the challenging topic before i rest i take the opportunity to invite you all for iocon 2021 goa please register and book your hotels as early as possible presently registrations are more than 2400 and we are expecting figure may cross 5000 and at a certain point we may have to stop the registration because of constraints due to festival and tourism in the month of december as our conference is during 21st december to 25th december thanks for patient hearing jai hind jai maharashtra and i hand over the mic to today's convener dr prakash sridhar for further proceeding thank you very much thank you good evening sir uh, and thank you very much for guiding us on the second webinar of this month october month we are celebrating as osteoporosis month uh, for entire month the theme is osteoporosis uh, last uh, last sunday we discussed about the general principles of osteoporosis this sunday we are uh, going to discuss about osteoporosis and orthopedics and the next webinar will be on spine and ortho, uh, osteoporosis hip and osteoporosis and reach joint fractures and osteoporosis so uh, today we are having eminent speakers and we are having uh, two cases also uh, about speakers dr ajit chinde sir has introduced in detail uh, we will take three uh, talks first followed by one case and then another three talks and then followed by the case uh, now i will request dr ram chadda sir organizing secretary of iocon 2021 to uh, enlighten us about the uh, preparations of iocon 2021 ram chadda sir thank you very much dr prakash sigedar thank you very much dr ajit shinde it's indeed a proud privilege for me here today to be speaking to a cross section of the largest orthopedic association in the world which is the indian orthopedic association and talking to the two chapters which are the largest chapters of the indian orthopedic associations the tamil nadu and the maharashtra chapters at first i may thank and would like to thank our esteemed guests led by anthony vilan bimalraj and dr sarvanan the president and secretary of the tnoa and our lovely speakers and guests who are here dr tanapan dr rex and dr jx all the way from tamil nadu and our own senior speakers including dr gs kulkarni dr sangeet gawade dr vikas agashi who will make a presentation of a case and the two case presentations dr ji abala ji ase gaonkar and my other friends and colleagues i also thank dr sigeda dr biraris and dr abhijit kade for being here that may i welcome you all to what has been a challenge a covid challenge which made us change leave lethal elements out and move from mumbai to goa our president dr b shivashankar decided that we have to have an atmanirbhar orthopedic conference indian at heart and global in competence hence we have changed from mumbai to goa the 66th annual conference is now in goa 21st to 25th of december i'm sure most of you have registered and those of you who have not i am make humble plea please do come forward we have an excellent program awaiting you 8 am to 2 pm is when we are doing the academics in hard core at the dr shama prasad mukherjee indoor stadium and there are multiple convention hotels around please book your tickets because i am giving you now a birds eye view of what you are going to see between 21st and 25th of december at the dr shama prasad mukherjee indoor stadium why did we move to goa well the chief minister and health minister of goa assured us complete support the likelihood thing in december is probably the highest liberal policies in december and we've seen our own prime minister make a plea as to how is opening goa post pandemic most of us who've been stuck at home for almost 2 years need to get out which better place than goa we visited the prior the chief minister of goa that's dr pramod savant who's there and we were actually welcomed by him and with the good efforts of our president dr shiv shankar our 
secretary dr navin thakkar our organizing chairman dr ajit shinde and our co chairman dr shivanand bandekar who is also the dean of the goa medical college we went and met him and have got the assurance that each one of you is welcome to be there we have 13 and a half thousand members of the ioa expecting a large cross section to be there besides taking over the shama prasad mukherjee indoor stadium which is here as it stands we've taken over large areas to the right and the left to the right there's a large cricket ground and to the left there's a huge football ground we've got crossed the sports authorities of india and beyond this entire dr shama prasad mukherjee indoor stadium we have a huge area here which is the cricket ground and a huge area here which is the football ground why are we doing this because this is good enough for 2500 people we are almost close to 2500 today hence we need to have a larger footprint and we are moving all around we welcome you there you will be there from tuesday to saturday and through the week what are we going to have there on tuesday you will have your post graduate teaching program and your various workshops on wednesday we have the dr k t dolakya cme current concepts in orthopedic techniques and technology dr sahu from the orissa chapter along with the moa has planned a fantastic program very crisp and you must attend it thursday friday and saturday which is 8 to thursday 8 to 2 on uh, friday and 8 to 2 on saturday we'll have the main conference we have taken all our permissions whether it's the sports minister whether it's the vice chancellor and we've also got access to lovely hotels and beaches where we are going to have the post 2:30 3 o'clock programs yes our banquet on 24th night christmas eve is on the beach at the sita de the goa and we look forward to you joining us there we are also exploring a visit to the casino we are trying to get permissions to have large groups there if we do manage it will be something first of its kind yes after 66 years for the first time goa is getting a national conference dr g s kulkarni who is here and who is the chief and our role model and in charge of the scientific committee has got the entire grid ready whether it's workshops pg teaching cme entire conference including the pg quiz where our dear friend from west bengal dr rajiv raman has planned a lovely program may i share with you we've got more than 2000 abstracts and we've shut abstracts another 10 days we'll start getting feedbacks as to who are the people selected for the 11 gold medals and the three special sections besides the free paper sessions yes we have more than 2000 registrations we have are grid ready which includes all the three days of the conference logistically all the sops are in place for a face to face conference yes there will be some travel restrictions as they stand today to enter goa you need a vaccination certificate of a final vaccination more than 15 days old or you need an rt pcr done 48 hours earlier which i think is well and good international faculty travel is still plus minus but things may and finally our trade partners are coming in they are happy to be in goa we've taken about 11 hotels in close vicinity we are getting you rooms at cost please understand goa in december is expensive despite that we've got the rooms which you can reach out to and get at cost from us there will be a period till which they will be available thereafter mind you we can't hold on to the rooms please join us take all the inputs from the cec central executive committee of the ioa headed by dr dibishiv shankar the entire academics which are sri dev or the three senior most members of our particular state dr gs kulkarni dr sudhir babulkar and dr dd tanna are masterminding to give you an excellent program and then it's all the rest of us we mostly from maharashtra dr ajit shinde dr garigune dr parag sancheti ran karne dr gore gaonkar dr gade dr avinash patel dr gandhi dr durjat dr sigedar dr sunil shahane dr sanjog kadam dr abhyankar dr raviraj shinde dr vishal kunnani 
This is just the cross section which has started working even before the fear of COVID had gone away. Today, all of us and more are working towards making this a breathtaking, path-breaking conference. We have Vama event supporting us. We've broken all records and we've released a hard copy of the brochure. I'm sure many of you in Tamil Nadu would have received it. This is where we were yesterday morning, 2401 registrations. This is the abstract status when we shut off on the last day of September, 2166. This is again where we were yesterday, 592 registrations for the CME and 920 for the banquet. So my dear friends from Tamil Nadu, please, I look forward for you joining us. That's the state where I entered my private practice in orthopedics. 95 and 96, I was there at the MIOT hospitals, Chennai. That's what made me a spine after being an orthopedic surgeon for many, many years. So I owe it to you, Tamil Nadu, and I want you to join us with your families in large numbers in Goa at this year end. We've never been to Goa at Christmas time, and it's time that you will be there. Mind you, it's after two years that we are having a large physical conference. If it's important to you, you'll surely find a way to be there. If it's not, I'm sorry, you'll find an excuse. I request you, please be there with folded hands. I want each one of you to come there and spread the happiness and the joy that we would feel and have to share when we meet there. This is for you to reach out to me. I would be very happy to help any one of you and every one of you to be there. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Tamil Nadu, to join Maharashtra, the two largest states in making this particular MOA masterclass what it would be, again, academically brilliant. Thank you all, and please go ahead with the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Sigedar, for allowing me to speak here. Yeah, thank, thank, you. Very much. thank you very much, Ram Chanda, sir, uh, for... Uh, Detailing all about the IOCON 2021, we are sure that it will be a grand success. Uh, as it is an activity of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, IOCON 2021 uh, team, uh, today uh, this activity has one MMC accreditation point. Today we are having an MMC observer, Dr. Chaugule from Kolhapur. He may join anytime. Uh, uh, I request uh, somebody to take some screenshots for the MMC purpose. Today, we are having six talks in total and two cases. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Sangeet Gawale, and he will be guiding us about the uh, common sites of fragility fractures. Uh, Dr. Gawale, sir, is a senior orthopedic surgeon and professor uh, at Mumbai, and he is at present president of Bombay Orthopedic Society also. So I request Dr. Gawale, sir, to start with his talk, Common Sites of Fragility Fractures. Sangeet Gawale, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prakash Shigedar. Uh, since we have colleagues from Tamil Nadu, let me tell you, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association till now had done 75 webinars in this one and a half years. And that credit goes to the dynamic president, Dr. Ajit Shinde, and Dr. Karne, who is, a, who is a secretary of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Uh, Dr. Ram Chadda, our Bombay Orthopedic Society's PRAS president, is a organizing secretary for Goa. And please don't miss the opportunity to have uh, to host you uh, in that beautiful place. So to begin with, today's uh, Topic is on osteoporosis, and I would be speaking on common sites of fragility fractures. Uh, I can conclude my talk in only three slides because we all know these are the only three common sites where we have this osteoporotic fractures. So what I would be doing is I will try to cover what has not been allotted or what has not been given to anybody else so that there's no overlap and some unusual presentations uh, I would present during the course of my talk. 
So as we all know, Sangeet, your slides are not moving. Yeah, yeah. Man, started, started. Uh, osteoporosis is a disease burden, <laughs> and it is due to its silent nature. We are unaware till the patient lands up with a fracture. its related fractures remain largely underdiagnosed and undermanaged because the patient presents to us only when he has a fracture and then we diagnose that as osteoporosis and related treatment is started the patterns as you can see from this slides uh, in between 55 to 65 we have the metaphyseal distal <laughs> which is the commonest at that age group then as the age advances between 65 and 75 we have the second commonest vertebral fractures and lastly in the late between 75 and 85 we have this uh, hip fracture which is uh, at that age because of the other associated comorbidities the uh, treatment is very difficult because we have to look at the other management also so as the age advances the fracture related morbidity also increases and that is why we have all the complications maximum in these hip fractures when we see across all the ages in india the statistics what are available uh, specific to the vertebra hip the proximal humerus the distal radius and the other fractures the vertebra have a major share of 17% the hip and the other areas the proximal humerus and the distal radius they contribute to roughly about 3% altogether so the vertebral fractures are the most commonest fractures where the patients present to us in females it is easy to diagnose because most of them they start with some symptoms post menopausal the problem is in the men older men the risk of hip fractures or the vertebral fracture is 30% higher than in women of the same age and male osteoporosis largely remains underdiagnosed and untreated and it is revealed only after a occurrence of a fracture so till that time most of the men they are not diagnosed of osteoporosis the international osteoporosis federation uh describes this 1 minute osteoporosis risk test which is very useful to make the public aware so the risk factors of the osteoporosis are taken into account and 19 questions whether uh, the family the patient has a family history personal history his lifestyle and the association uh, of the risk of osteoporosis is then calculated with the score and these other factors apart from age sex is the previous factor whether the patient had whether the patient has a family history of a hip fracture his parents or her parents had whether the patient is on glucocorticosteroid he is smoking whether he is taking consuming alcohol or there are any other secondary causes of osteoporosis which are taken in account and the frac score is then calculated which gives uh, uh the risk of the future fractures it uses clinical risk factors to identify patients at risk, high risk for osteoporosis related fractures it provides 10 years probability of hip fractures and 10 years probability of major osteoporosis related fractures as a orthopedic surgeon uh, we have an opportunity unlike our other colleagues uh, often we are the healthcare professional that patient sees in the emergency room when the patient lands up with a fracture almost always we encounter osteoporotic patients after they have experienced a fracture it is not the physician it is not the rheumatologist it is not the gynecologist who is going to see the patient it is we the orthopedic surgeon and we have the opportunity to not only fix the fracture but also to evaluate 
whether the fracture may be related to osteoporosis, primary or secondary. And then we can coordinate secondary fracture prevention with other treating physicians to improve the long-term care and the outcome of these patients. So we are the only one which have the opportunity once we receive a patient at that age group of diagnosing osteoporotic fracture and subsequently preventing a second fracture, which is very likely if the osteoporosis is untreated. The commonest area where we see almost 50% is in the spine. Typical compression fractures can be managed, most of them non-surgically. Only 30% of the people with vertebral fracture seek medical opinion. Two third are asymptomatic and diagnosed incidentally on a plain radiograph. So almost three fourth, they do not do even the X-ray or they do not have any symptoms. Most fracture occur in the thoracic or thoracolumbar region and are often stable. It needs only short term bed rest, bracing, and some medications to relieve the nociceptive pain. In the small percentage of patient in whom non-surgical treatment is unsuccessful, cement augmentation is a viable option. And for that, a good classification which can be of our help is this one, where the osteoporotic fractures can be divided into five. The first category is where on MRI, there are only edema changes. Structure of the vertebra is normal. In second type, even the anterior and the posterior wall is maintained. The structure is also overall uh, maintained. In type three, the structure of that changes and there is a shortening of the posterior wall or the anterior wall. And type four, we have either a collapse and shortening of the posterior wall or there could be a pincher effect wherein the end plates superiorly and inferiorly are fractured. And type 5, these are distraction and rotational injuries, very, very rare, wherein apart from the anterior middle column, even the posterior elements are disrupted. And this category requires a surgery. But I say this is very, very rare. So these are the fracture pattern which we should be aware while managing a patient. But two third do not require any treatment. They can be managed conservative very well. Those who do not respond, those who go for pseudoarthrosis, they are the only one which require treat, surgical treatment. The second commonest is uh, the distal radius fractures. 80% of these patients and uh, these distal radius, they have a peculiar they are involved the metaphysis. Most of them, they do not involve the intraarticular side. So it is a compact impaction of the metaphysis. That is what most commonly seen. 80% of the patient identified to be at risk for osteoporosis are after distal radius fracture, where amenable to further osteoporosis workup after their injury. So after a patient sustained a distal radius fracture, almost 80% of them had uh, where they had a fracture due to osteoporosis and then we can start the treatment because they present at an earlier age as compared to hip fracture or vertebral fractures. The volar locking plate for distal radius fracture in osteoporotic patient has yielded better short-term result as compared to other method of fixation like fixator or a K-wire or other uh, methods of fixation or even close reduction. So that maintains the length of the radius and patient can be started with uh, early mobilization, which is a goal in managing most of the osteoporotic fractures. Fracture of the pelvis and acetabulum, most need no surgical treatment. Early mobilization in this population greatly reduces the incidence of complication that occur with prolonged immobilization and bed rest and allows the fracture to heal early. The four types of these fracture uh, described by
these are the four types of fracture type 1 which involves the anterior ring so in elderly these fracture unlike the younger generation where uh, they have a vehicular accident these are an a high energy fractures in elderly they have a very low energy fractures these are hemodynamically stable and most require conservative treatment the goal is to mobilize them as early as possible out of the bed so type 1 involves the anterior ring only type 2 there may be a insufficiency fracture of the sacral alley or of the sacrum but mostly it is undisplaced so it may involve the posterior ring also but these are stable fractures and they can be well managed conservatively the third variety again and the fourth varieties are unstable pattern they rarely heal spontaneously the fourth variety third may or may not heal recommendation for fourth type is to treat surgically preferably with long percutaneous screw the type 3 includes the anterior ring and the sacral complete fracture with the disruption of the posterior ring and four involves the posterior ring as well as the anterior ring and that is a unstable fracture this four variety is very very rare so overall even for the pelvis and acetabulum conservative treatment is uh, required in most of these fractures the proximal humerus uh, again they the fractures are usually seen in the metaphysis high rate of construct failure even with the improved locking plate technology are seen uh, this was earlier with the improved design and uh, better understanding the failure rate which was earlier 35% has been uh, which has been reported with this construct has been brought down significantly from 2014 to 2021 so a better understanding of this fracture better way of fixation better way of reduction has helped in reducing complications in these elderly who have osteoporotic proximal humerus fracture the another most commonest is the hip fractures are among the most common and debilitating injuries in these elderly persons even with modern surgical treatment the one year mortality is 30% the unstable intertrochanteric fractures have yielded failure rate of 50% in the presence of osteoporosis with dhs fixation and hence it is a standard that we must use a intramedullary device whenever possible because they provide a load sharing construct and that helps in a healing of the fracture without a complication with lesser complication i mean a uh, hip fracture gives us a opportunity to provide a state of art care to fix the fracture it ensures we treat the metabolic disease uh, and not just end up fixing this fracture with plate and screws or nail but it gives you opportunity to identify and treat the osteoporosis but also prevent the next fracture if you have treated the osteoporosis well influence of osteoporosis in implant fixation failure we all know and we cannot predict how your implant is going to hold a particular uh, femoral head uh, even though it looks good in some cases on day one but you can it can end up in a disaster like this which requires a subsequent replacement this was a lady who had a ipsilateral fracture of the subtrochanter and the shaft and she was treated with a, a, a long pfn the proximal screws migrated out of that and the lateral wall or the greater trochanter was broken and the nail had cut through the entire proximal femur so in this situation what is needed is to realign graft it and use a long implant even if you use uh, the nail could not be used in this particular situation because the lateral wall was broken uh, because the nail had cut out so even if you use a such a longer implant uh, you can end up in a good result provided she is metabolically treated as well and so that is about the common fractures what we see the common patterns of fractures what we see i'll speak about something which is very unusual so 
This is a 70 year old lady who presented with severe pain on the medial malleolus. There was no history of any injury. There were no signs of infection. Routine investigations were normal and there was no other metabolic disease. So that was the area where she was painful. At three to four weeks, when we repeated the X-ray again, uh, there was no, uh, there's nothing there on the medial side, but her pain was persistent. She didn't had any relief with splints, analgesic, local creams, nothing. We did a MRI and to our surprise, we found out a fracture. There is an edema around the fra insufficiency fracture. And uh, you can see it is not a complete fracture, but this is what was giving her pain, which was uh, very, for her, it was difficult to walk also. And you can see that fracture, which is not complete, which involves only the anterior side of the medial malleolus. Posteriorly, all what we see is a edema. So she was treated with a proper treatment for osteoporosis. And in six weeks, in about three weeks of treatment, the pain totally disappeared. And only thing what she had at six weeks x-ray is a telltale sign of a healed uh, insufficiency fracture. So uh, excruciating pain, not relieved with uh, uh, normal analgesics, splints, you must always look for these type of fractures. Another lady, about 60 years, severe pain on postromedial side here. It was not at the level of joint. She was very specific. There was no history of trauma. The range of movement was normal. The joint line tenderness was not there. She was being treated for osteoarthritis. And this pain was unusual for osteoarthritis. And again, on MRI, you can see at the postromedial side of the tibia, again, there is the edema and there you can see the fracture line, which is incomplete. And you can see in the AP, uh, the coronal cuts, the extent of the edema, it involves only the medial condyle. So that was that insufficiency fracture. Again, she was treated and she is relieved. Uh, this lady was being treated for osteoporosis with uh, alendronate and uh, she had a previous multiple surgeries of the proximal femur. She came uh, absolutely normal walking, but she had a pain which was progressively increasing in about two weeks time. We couldn't find anything in this X-ray and to our surprise on the CT, she had this extent of fracture. And when probing, she said she had slipped, but she was able to walk for these two weeks. So a CT scan revealed the extent of fracture, though it is undisplaced, but the amount of pain is tremendous in such type of fractures. This uh, uh, another lady, she had a hip fracture and uh, the treatment failed following previous surgery. So a total hip was done and she was fine postoperatively. At one year, she presents again with a thigh pain. The X-ray appears to be normal, but uh, she came again repeatedly, but repeat X-rays also did not reveal. But retrospectively, uh, we enlarged the view and we could see that same fracture here, a stress fracture through the entire uh, tip of the stem, proximal tip of the stem. And that was treated by a compression plate. And in about six months time, that all healed beautifully with, uh, along with the treatment of her metabolic disease. So that is another variety which you should look for. The other problem is in such type of osteoporotic fractures, uh, one single implant is not helpful so when you're treating the shaft or the diaphyseal fractures, which have wide medullary canal, a combination of implant where only nail does not give you adequate stability, you must look for other elements. And in the metaphyseal fractures where there is a combination, always use a longer implant to improve the construct stability. In summary, osteoporosis, which is a silent disease, which cannot be diagnosed because patients do not have symptoms. The secondary prevention of fragility fracture is high priority with osteoporosis expert due to the high risk of future fractures. A large care gap 
indicates the need for innovative programs to identify these high risk patients and target them to evaluation and further treatment and therapy for osteoporosis thank you very much so thank you very much sangeet gawale sir for enlightening us on the common sites of fragility fractures Uh, mostly weight bearing uh, fractures like hip spine and wrist are the common commonest fractures metaphysis being the common vulnerable site and in uh, campbell it is written that person comes in the world through the pelvis and goes to the hip joint so such is the common incidence of these fractures and uh, thank you very much for enlightening us and now i request our, our second speaker uh, Dr. G. S. Kulkarni sir, who is a Bishnu Pitama of our fraternity, and he will guide us on uh, problems of fixation of the fractures in osteoporotic bones. He has a very vast experience, and I have uh, listened him on this subject many times. Uh, I request Dr. G. S. Kulkarni sir to start with his presentation: problems of fracture fixation in fragility fractures. Okay. Uh, can you see the slide, please? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. uh thank you sigdar and uh, i enjoyed the talk by sangeet you know is very nice presentation of some cases which are really eye opener some of the cases he has shown very good um my topic is problems of fracture fixation in osteoporotic bone i will quickly deal with the problems and the some of the very very interesting cases which will have problem and solutions and also i am going to present to you a new concept in uh, fracture fixation especially osteoporotic bone the problems are the elderly person himself she has usually some comorbidity like heart lung kidney liver neurological symptoms uh, diabetes mellitus alcohol smoking and so on may not be fit for surgery that is another problem and limit we have to limit our surgery to optimum fixation like minimally invasive surgery intramedullary nailing mipo or even a tension band wiring careful rehabilitation is very very important and because most of the elderly persons are non cooperative and the solution for this is a team work is very very essential A, a trivial injury may cause severe comminution and may be very difficult to reduce and fix as you see in this case the soft bone it is a soft bone there say which is a biggest problem bone failure is common any implant even if the most modern implant may fail because of the soft bone it may cut out it may penetrate the joint break bend or back out implant holding capacity is very poor the poor holding capacity even most modern implant may fail and therefore replacement may be the answer post operative complications are innumerable pneumonitis embolism delirium dementia bed sore infection fixation problems and so many others i will not enumerate all now the conventional plate dcp is usually should not be used for uh, osteoporotic fractures because of a toggling of the screws in the porotic bone therefore use lcp i want to introduce you a new concept of absolute fix absolute tube fixation which is propagated by Cody Kojima in injury editorial october 2017 supplement this is a combination of absolute and relative fixation which he calls it as absolute tube fixation i have not found any articles on this subject but i have found it very useful in difficult complex fractures which i will enumerate to you especially in osteoporotic bones this has become a boon to me i will show you some cases nail which is a relative fixation plus 
plate, which is a compressive fixation. If you combine these two, you are combining the relative fixation and compressive fixation. So, which he calls it as absolute because you are combining the both. A biomechanical studies in the distal femur of using nail and plate have shown that the nail plate combination is the best of the implants, which is most stable. Biomechanically proved in three biomechanical studies. And nail and plate become the strongest nail, protects the bending. The nail protects the bending and minimally, it is minimally invasive and weight allows weight bearing. Whereas plate prevents rotation and length and it compresses. So they combine together and complement each other. And this combination is stronger than any either nail or plate, especially in osteoporotic bone. I will show you cases. See this case. This is a case of non-union and was treated with a nail and a plate and bone graft. This we have done, uh, this is what is called accessory plating and help a lot. This is what I call absolute fixation. And we have done quite a number of these cases. And this is another case, a 10 month old non-union. And this was treated with a nail and a plate and fracture united. Now the 10 basic principles of osteoporotic fractures are you must use usually a load sharing implant like nail, especially in the diaphyseal fractures. Impaction in, in a situation like this and buttress plating, which is biological, long splintage, uh, bone augmentation by cement or by any other orthobiologics or uh, Shortening of the some amount of up to two centimeters, you can shorten in the lower limb, and up to five centimeters, you can shorten in the upper limb. Uh, replacement is another good answer. And uh, this is LCP, I have told you, and absolute fixation in a dual implants. Now, hip fragility is the most serious and a common fracture and also most problematic of all fractures, as Sangeet has pointed out. Now, this is a lateral wall, which is burst. You can see here how the lateral wall is burst and displaced. All these fragments need to be brought together and by closed method, and also by closed method, you reconstruct the lateral by augmentation with a wire and a screw. I, I like augmentation very much in a lateral wall and we have our uh, results have definitely improved by reconstructing the lateral wall. In eye intertrochantric fracture, these two are very important. As Sangeet has pointed out, nailing is, appears to be a better choice, but the shattered lateral wall, wall causes instability, prevents collapse and medialization. Another point is, if you do not fix the lateral wall, the fragments are loose and they move out and cause edema, swelling, pain, and even sometimes infection. Therefore, reconstruct the lateral wall is an important part of uh, treating intertrochantric fracture. Reduction, especially the medio inferior cortices of the proximal fragment and the distal fragment is important. This is a long coronal complex fracture. Nail alone will fail. So we have now using nail and a plate combination, as I told you, this absolute technique. And this technique has really improved our results. Good results. Another example, this is a banana type. Again, we use the lateral reconstruction. This is a This is done by percutaneously. You can see how it is done percutaneously. And it takes hardly 10 minutes to uh, reconstruct the lateral wall. 
by either a plate or a screw or by tension band wiring. We published this in injury 2017. Sometimes you need a replacement for intertrochantic fracture. In this case, we used a long stem, which is a little costly, but it has helped this patient. Fracture neck femur, age less than 55. Even if it is osteoporotic, you must fix. There is no need for replacement for this fracture. 55 to 65 is a gray zone. Good bone, you can fix it. Porosis, comorbidity, replace it. However, decision depends upon the age, porosis, comorbidity, whether he is physiologically active or not, he or she. He, he or she has arrived within 24 hours. And on the table also, if there is anatomical reduction, we go ahead for fixation. If it is not, we replace. We keep both ready in such situations. Above 65, replace. There is no doubt about it. The results are so fantastic with the modern replacement technique. This is a very interesting case. This agriculturist was working in the field and had a fall in the uh, accident. And he was treated like this. And you can see that there is a entry point is wrong. This is a straight nail, a wrong nail, wrong technique. And therefore, this went on into non-union. For one year, he was with non-union pain. He was still working. And what happened was with this technique, he developed a stress fracture in the neck. And he, after one year, after one year, he had a fracture neck femur. But unfortunately, he could not come because of his financial position. Six weeks after the fracture, he could come to us. You can notice there is a displacement and neck femur. So the, we had a discussion whether to do uh, valgus osteotomy and retrograde nail or whether to do this. We decided to do our technique of uh, a very stable fixation, rigid fixation by a triangular method. And this had worked very well. Within six months, the fracture united and the patient go, went back to work. Now, this is another case. This is a 58-year-old boy, 58-year-old uh, man uh, was, treated with a, was treated with a recent very uh, new implant by Deputysynthes called femoral system. It appears to be a very good implant to me. It has, however, controlled collapse. It allows controlled collapse. After 65, as I told you, replacement is the answer. Subtrochanter is again a problem. When you see such X-rays, you must investigate for parathyroid or multiple myeloma and other things. So this was treated, this was osteoporosis, this was treated with uh, osteoporotic drugs and uh, uh, nailing, you were told this. Now, in this is a very bad fracture, bad subtrochanted fracture, uh, comminuted, and you can see the coronal split, long coronal split. So we did with a nail plus plate and absolute stability. And this has worked very well in this case. Now, distal femur, again, notice how the osteoporosis caused such a severe comminution in an elderly person like this. Uh, this was treated with a nail and a plate and the fracture united. This is a steroid-induced osteoporosis. He was <clears throat> taking basma in a village by a, uh, some Ayurvedic person, which contained steroid. We investigated and the basma was proved to be containing steroid, and then he was treated with nailing and antiporotic drugs. Sorry. Ah, now, this is a case of an uh, elderly person with severe infection, was treated outside with a nail, and got very severe infection. And this was treated with, again, a nail, plus external fixator. Again, a dual implant, a fixator causes compression, 
and the nail stabilizes this. So nail and external fixator gives excellent. We allowed him to walk on this debridement and thoroughly. Said. Once the infection was under control, we changed to uh, intramedullary locking. There was a mild, still mild infection, but we did uh, interlocking nail plus plate and compressed the fragment. So nail and plate, the fracture united. So the non-union unites even in the presence of infection. If the fracture is very, very stably fixed. This patient had a mild sinus for six to seven months, but then it disappeared automatically. I wouldn't take him any, uh, any antibiotics or any debridement. Uh, fractures of the shaft are best treated by nailing. This is another example in which uh, elderly person has got a fracture like this. You can see that there is a very, very thin uh, bone here and very difficult to fix this. So what uh, is currently uh, is that you use the fibula and the plate for it, tibia. So you pass three or four syndesmotic type of screws from plate through fibula and tibia. So what is called a profibula tibia fixation. So you use three or four fiction and it gives excellent results. This is an, a case of an elderly person with uh, ankle infection, was treated outside with uh, uh, fixation of the fracture, but he got infected, severely infected. After again, thorough debridement, uh, we fixed it with a retrograde nail. And again, as it is a case of infected non-union, there must be some infection lurking behind. So we fixed it with a plate also. Nail and a plate combination is again in this case and the fracture united nicely. Proximal humerus, uh, what is important is uh, Amar Rangan's index article, which was uh, has revolutionized the world. And he suggested non-operative treatment. And this has been followed in many cases that elderly person with comorbidities, if there is not much of a displacement, the results of operative and non-operative treatment are the same. However, if there is a displacement, the operative treatment is necessary very much. If there is very much displayed, you can use nail or plate as suggested by Sangeet, that is a good um, and replacement if there is severe osteoporosis. Uh, Sangeet has talked about this. Uh, this is a divergent screws worked very well in this situation. Another example of uh, a very severely comminuted fracture and with excellent results with the, uh, with the locking plate. This is, we have developed a technique of what is called a twisted plate. We twist the plate to 90 degrees and pass on from here. Anteriorly, you can see that there is anteriorly no structure at all anteriorly. You can pass anteriorly, it is safe. The vessels and nerves on this medial side and the radial nerve is on the lateral side. So it is not involved. So you can see that this gets very well. So this fracture united very nicely. Now, this 65-year-old lady had a fracture. This was treated outside like this. And then they did bone grafting and then also plating, but uh, conventional plate was used. This failed again and the plate broke and we treated with uh, a locking plate compression with the two conventional screws and then six uh, uh, locking screws and bone grafting, fracture united. Another case of a non-union here, he came to us at this stage, but uh, he refused surgery. He had pain and uh, definitely there is a non-union, but he, re he refused surgery and came back after one year with this situation. Uh, this was a completely necrotic bone. We have to remove that. And we did a, a fibular graft from here to here, bone grafting, cancellous bone grafting, and a locking plate, and it worked very well. Another example of a uh, osteoporotic bone, uh, elderly person, 
uh, this did not unite. And after removal of this, this was the situation. And again, we did a uh, fibular graft with uh, fixation of the and bone grafting. Now, this is a, another interesting case that you get often that there is severe osteoarthritis here. And, and then she developed, as uh, Sangeet has shown some cases, stress fracture, uh, uh, secondary to osteoarthritis. And this was treated with a, with a long stem on the left, uh, on the right side, and the uh, long stem, this was here, here. And on the, sorry, uh, this was case, another case of a, uh, a stress fracture here. And this was treated with a long stem, and this was treated with a short stem. So the patient was very happy with this uh, situation. Now, periprosthetic fractures, of, uh, the modern treatment is again the circlage wire, bone grafting, and fixation, better fixation. Another example of a, a periprosthetic fracture, uh, circlage wire and bone grafting has really, and the plating in some cases, all three together has really helped the uh, periprosthetic fractures. This is an elderly person who had who was treated outside with a um, fracture of the distal end of the radial distal end of the uh, humerus uh, failed and it uh, united so we treated with a locking plate you can see the locking plate here, both sides and it united nicely with good function now tension band can be used this is a very very simple procedure you can use in uh, especially in distal femur, distal humerus, uh, elbow around elbow, you can use uh, tension band wiring in ulna and distal uh, uh, end of the humerus and distal uh, malleolar fractures on both sides. You can use uh, greater tuberosity of the humerus and a greater trochanter. Uh, yet these four cases, you can very easily use the tension band wiring with successfully. I will show you some two, three cases, very, very interesting cases. This is a 13 year old girl had body pain. She had rheumatoid arthritis and she had convulsions. So she was given steroids on a large, for a longer time for rheumatoid arthritis, anti-convulsions and methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. So she developed severe osteoporosis, osteomalacia. You can notice that she has a triradiate pelvis and a fracture neck femur, bilateral, bilateral distal femur. She developed this and was unable to walk for a long time. She was bedridden. To our great surprise, on starting the anti anti uh, uh, resorptive drugs and uh, osteoporotic drugs and a high dose of vitamin D. Within eight days, her pain disappeared and within 15 days, she could sit up and walk with a walker and then we fixed her on both sides and she was all right. So this is a very interesting case of a... Death. Now, this lady, 48-year-old lady, had severe osteoporosis and was treated as osteoporosis with the vitamin D, calcium, and alundronate. But she was not improving. She went on from bad to worse and developed pathological fracture. When she came to us, we did a metabolic study and found that there was a hyperparathyroidism. This was a case of hyperparathyroidism. And the nodule was excised and was fixed then, and she recovered completely. You can see this. Now, this is last case. Very interesting. This 15-year-old boy developed, gradually developed uh, Janu Halgam and a bad limb. And he was very bad. He was a good student in class, but recently he became very dull and uh, in, inattentive and all that. So he was treated psychiatric as a psychiatric patient for a long time. 
and then when he started severe walking he was he was brought to us and we found this was a bilateral scaphy this made us to do uh, endocrine investigations and found that he also had hyperparathyroidism the nodule was excised and he had severe genovalgum a case of hyperparathyroidism nodule was excised and then you can see that he had we had to do here a varus osteotomy and we have to do a valgus osteotomy here a valgus osteotomy proximally and a varus osteotomy distally this was done on one, on the uh, right right side we did uh, uh, with a lizaro technique and we thought we just to let us see how the plate works because he was very much tired of uh, elizaro so we thought we did this and we did distally we did elizaro just two rings both worked very well but on the elizaro side he could completely uh, flex the knee and uh, hip on the on the this side he was slightly at this so you can see that this all united nicely and this is the final final picture of the x rays uh, valgus osteotomy proximally varus osteotomy distally bilaterally and this patient has completely recovered so friends in conclusion any osteoporotic patient fully investigate the osteoporosis case study this absolute concept which i am introducing to you this has not been talked of or not been published in the paper but i am introducing to you please try this and this may completely change the concept of fracture healing whether it is absolute fixation or a, uh, because uh, peron has said that don't mix these two important uh, biomechanically biologically the compressive method and the elastic method they are entirely different don't ever mix them that is what uh, peron has said but i think the time has come to change this concept thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, for uh, such a uh, elaborative talk and guiding us on this occasion uh, it was an excellent talk uh, i have forgotten to uh, give chance to uh, president of tamil nadu Arth orthopedic association dr uh, m antony mulraj if he is there uh, he uh, yeah uh, i will request the secretary of tamil nadu orthopedic association pt sarvanan yeah, to talk on this occasion and introduce uh, the three speakers of today's talk because third talk is by uh, dr c rex from coimbatore i will request dr p sarvanan to talk on this yeah. occasion and also yeah good evening everyone i am dr yeah. p sarvanan the secretary of uh, tamil nadu orthopedic association Yeah. First, I like to congratulate the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association for organizing a MOA master class regularly. It's more than seventy programs are conducted, and it's uh, also for IOCON cut and riser. So, uh, once again, thank you for uh, involving us and our faculties for this today's uh, program, Osteoporosis Month. Uh, so, we have uh, three eminent speakers from Tamil Nadu. One is uh, Dr. C. Rex. He is from uh, Coimbatore. He is. Uh, uh, He is running a Rex Orthopedic Hospital. It's a DNB Training Institute. He is a very senior uh, person, and he is uh, executive committee member of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. So we have another uh, person, uh, Dr. Thanapan. He is a professor of orthopedics at uh, Madurai Medical College. He is a past editor of uh, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association and coordinator of uh, TNOA PG Teaching Program. Last year, he has conducted more than thirty-three programs during this uh, COVID pandemic. So our third speaker is uh, Dr. Jay Kish. he is from uh, tiruchirappalli so another uh, city from tamil nadu so he he is owning a hospital there atlas orthopedic hospital he is a very famous uh, trauma surgeon in the eastern part of tamil nadu so once again i thank thank you all so over to uh, dr prakash thank you sir yeah. yeah thank you very much sir and now i request uh, dr c rex uh, to talk on surgical solutions in fragility fractures hello good evening everyone yeah. um, is my uh, slide visible sir yeah 
Yes, sir. Yes. So good evening, uh, all the respected uh, senior faculty, uh, Professor Kulkarni, Dr. Prakash, and uh, uh, MOA, and also TNOA uh, members, and uh, President Secretary. And I, I'm very grateful uh, to give this lecture on behalf of uh, uh, TNOA. So uh, my, uh, my lecture today is going to be on surgical solutions in fragility fractures. Majority of things have been covered, but still I thought I will go through the principles and uh, rivet on certain aspects of uh, the surgical, surgical aspect, which uh, the junior colleagues should uh, know and uh, understand when they, when they see a patient with osteoporosis. See, the, the most important aspect of um, treatment is optimal care for the fracture patient. You should see the patient as a whole, very, very important keeping the patient alive because they are all very elderly people with a lot of medical issues. Fixing the fracture is one aspect and the surgical challenges which we will face uh, because of fixing these fractures, we, which I will uh, tell you in a minute. Keeping the patient mobile immediately, that is very, very important because mobility is the crux of uh, success. And if these elderly patients are immobile, they're bound to get uh, pneumonia, uh, bed sore, infection and all the problems will creep up one after another. And keeping the patient uh, from re returning again to your fracture unit because of recurrent fractures is a disaster. So you need to treat the osteoporosis also vigilantly uh, when you see this patient. So the treatment of patient as a whole is very, very important. When I say keeping the patient alive, the, these patients many times may not be fit enough for a surgery when they present to you with osteoporotic fracture. They may be having comorbidities because of the cardiac problem or renal problem or COPD, asthma, or sometimes even hyponatremia because they present you late. Hypoproteinemia is again a big problem. And so all these uh, multiple comorbidities which we need to address and take care uh, before optimizing them to undergo surgery. So that is very, very important. And it is a, it is a race between the time of surgery and how to optimize the patient. So you need to get them at the earliest optimum time to uh, get them right and then get them to the fracture fixation. And most of the times they'll be on blood thinners or neurotrophic drugs or anti-Parkinson's drugs. And all these need to be monitored and must be and dose adjusted according to the anesthetic protocol. Um, so uh, it, is, it is always uh, you have a big, good team of people a senior physician to uh, take care of your patient. So the orthogeriatric team uh, is very, very important to make a good judgment. And also a senior most surgeon must do the procedure in a osteoporotic patient. That is very, very important because the timing of surgery, how much time you spend with the patient uh, when you operate on these fragility fractures may, makes a lot of difference because the blood loss must be minimal. You need to have quick surgery and also, uh, as uh, Professor Kulkarni said, the absolute st and relative stability combination of both absolute use st stability also you should achieve when you do these fixations. So all these are very, very important. So orthogeriatric care involving the anesthetist, cardiologist, into internal medicine team and geriatrics and respiratory medicine, all these as, as one, uh, one team you should coordinate and uh, optimize the patient uh, to get the best, best results. So fixing the fracture, that is the biggest surgical challenge. And how to fix these osteoporotic fractures this is what we're going to discuss. And we as orthopedic surgeons, uh, we've been entitled to, entitled to make this patient to walk from day one. So you need to achieve a good stable fixation to, pay, to make them mobilized. Otherwise, uh, you know, you run into trouble. And the main surgical challenges, because these are all mainly osteoporotic, the hold of screws uh, may not be good enough. It's not like, you know, on a wood, you, you screw the bone, you screw the, you screw it. It is like a uh, fixing on a butter. And these bones are, most of the cancerous bones, they crush and they create a void after a fracture reduction. So any void in the cancerous area will not heal. So we need to fill the voids. So this is very important, especially the osteoporotic fractures happen at the metaphyseal area and which is a soft bone. So how to achieve a good hold in an osteoporotic bone and how to fill the void, or you don't want any defects in the cancerous bone, which uh, should run in your mind. So the, you need to think about the biology, 
what is happening at the uh, osteoporotic fracture site. So think about the biology, how to uh, you know uh, achieve both the concepts of filling the gap as well as good, getting a good hold. So if you address this, the chance of failure becomes very less and you choose an implant to optimize your end result. Um, so the surgical options to augment the fixation, the, either you can change the fracture environment by increasing the mass, like putting a filling it with a bone graft or the bone substitutes, or sometimes the big defects allografts, or sometimes the bone cement itself can be used to increase the and why the uh, the matrix or the, the, the stroma so because you are, you are improving the fracture environment your stabilization it becomes intrinsically more stable uh, by augmenting the the environment the second thing is looking at the implant implant conventional implants uh, like dcp may not have a good hold but the locking plate definitely has got a better pull out strength so this, uh, the locking plate is a good choice. Fixed angle plates, again, is good, especially in the proximal humerus. And when you have a long bone fracture, probably the intramedullary nail is a better choice than a uh, onlay plating or uh, you know, locking plates. Because intramedullary is a fixation, always a load sharing device, and definitely it works better. And there are nowadays the hydroxyapatite coated screws. Um, so to increase the uh, strength of the pull out strength of the screws. So you have various armamentarium uh, in the basket so that you can choose whatever you will, you can mix and match to improve the, uh, the stability of fixation. And whenever you feel that the fixation may fail or the fracture uh, pattern is so bad or is a periarticular fracture and you feel that you can make this patient mobile on day one by replacing the particular part especially the periarticular, then arthroplasty is def definitely is a viable option. So you think about as the patient as a whole, the whole scenario of the total care of the patient, not just the orthopedic point of view or just how to fix the fracture. So that is very important. And um, as I said earlier, avoid the problem with arthroplasty uh, by, by giving arthroplasty because advantage being early mobilization. Improving the fixation by fixed angle plates or hydroxyapatite screws, intravenous nail, and filling the void with cement. So these are a few examples. The proven arthroplasty is, uh, uh, which is a good idea in periprosthetic fractures, uh, in you know uh, the peri uh, joint fractures like intracapsular fracture, neck of femur, or um, a four part fracture, humerus, or you had a bag of bones in the elbow, or you have very bad intercondylar fracture in a very elderly where you feel that fixation may not work, probably arthroplasty is an alternative type of um, fixation. And hemiarthroplasty as, as, um, as established uh, as a um, preferred choice in most of the subcapital fractures and uh, also the total hip arthroplasty if the patient has got a good uh, mobility and is a community ambulant and if the patient is uh, uh, has doesn't have any more more comorbidities possibly totally is a definitely viable option in a three part or a four part fracture trochanter or intracapsular fracture. So here, though it is a uh, extracapsular with intracapsular extension, here we thought the best option would be to replace with a cemented bipolar and reconstruct the trochanter so that we can have a guaranteed result and this patient can walk on day one without much of an issue. And in case if you fix and goes for non-union, this patient will be bedridden and will run into a lot of uh, uh, other problems. So decision-making, depending on the patient's problem, is, uh, matters a lot. And here, a uh, very bad middle condyle fracture with the pre-existing OANE, possibly the best result would be to replace. And um, so a constrained condyle knee was used and uh, the revision components many times uh, may be necessary when you do the arthroplasty for a fracture in the around the knee joints. So that is very important. And always there is a controversy of uh, how to fix these fractures in, a, in a osteoporotics uh, in the proximal humerus, especially three and four part fractures. The early treatment, the best results.
can be either a fixation like this or a reverse shoulder arthroplasty definitely as is coming up in a big way for management of fourth part fracture humerus. And a bag of bones of a distal humerus with a severely osteoporotic elderly for immediate good function, especially the right hand, right elbow, possibly if you feel that the internal fixation will be in trouble because of the uh, sagittal and coronal split, uh, probably the elbow replacement is a better choice to have a good functional outcome. And um, as uh, the previous speaker said, that um, fully a locking plate has definitely the pillow plate has revolutionized the treatment of uh, simple fractures of the proximal humerus, especially three part fracture, where you go with a stable fixation and uh, the failures are pretty less. I would not say it is a foolproof technique, but definitely uh, the, the success rate is better than the previous implants and has got a better role in uh, three and two and three part fractures of the proximal humerus. And <clears throat> um, when you come to the uh, locking plate in the distal femur, the peri-implant fractures uh, where you can achieve a good compression as well as uh, stability by using a locking plate as a single unit it's like a simple internal fixator and you respect the biology and give it good healing. So you don't damage the periosteum and definitely the locking plate has got a viable option in a peri-implant fracture like this and you see the good healing. And the peri now, nowadays I would say that another entity of osteoporotic fracture is the periprosthetic fracture. I would definitely say it is a fragility fracture. Um, these patients already had a fracture and you put an implant and the patients again succumb to a simple trivial injury. They get a peri periprosthetic fracture or a peri implant fracture, which is a major uh, chunk of patients coming nowadays. And it, you find it very difficult to treat them. So there are certain principles which you need to follow when you treat the periprosthetic fracture. The most important, you need to span the bone entirely so that there is no stress riser anywhere. So if you have a, a fracture below the stem, probably the wiser option is put a longer implant to span across the whole diaphysis so you don't get a stress riser and another fracture just below the implant. And always try to get a bicortical fixation around the implant wherever, whenever possible. And longer implant is always necessary uh, to avoid stress rising. So this is very important. And in a very severe fragile osteoporotic bone like this, the patient with a peri-implant fracture, <clears throat> um, maybe simple uh, circulage wire is not good enough. She had already a uh, re-revision and she had a fracture at the tip of the processes. And you can see that uh, the bone is like a, something like a Dorsey type of femur, uh, stow-like stow, stow bone. And uh, here we managed with the locking plate, again, again with circulage wire to go around the plate uh, and had a good healing. So. Uh, they come with the combination of intramedullary and uh, on-lay plate fixation to get uh, absolute stability as described by Professor Kilkerney is definitely a good option in these set of osteoporotic bones. Um, this is another, another case of uh, uh, fracture just uh, happened just below the plate. This was only just six weeks down the line. The patient had a recurrent, another fall and, and broke uh, below the previous fracture. And beginning six weeks down the line, we were not able to remove the DHS implant. So we put a, a nail, retrograde nail, uh, distal femoral nail, and then uh, um, use the circulate wire to augment. And this went in for healing without any issue. So the combination of intramedullary and extra medullary fixation is sometimes of a good viable option. And spanning the whole bone across to prevent stress rising is definitely a, a, a important principle which you should learn and uh, do it accordingly. And uh, the, in the current situation of periprosthetic fracture, the recent uh, implants from Zimmer, the non-contact bridging plate, the the, from the DPU, you have a locking attachment plate, and from Smith & Nevis, the cord, a cord cable systems, all these are good choices and definitely a viable option in a periprosthetic implant fractures. The different locking, the locking, the angulation has, in, has increased compared to 30, you've got my 45 degree angle nowadays. The anatomical plates with the staggered holes here and there, eccentrically placed. So
so easy for you to place all around the implant. So wider area for the processes, offset holes. So you get a bicortical screw placement in different areas and site specific. And also you have a cable circulate system which you can screw it on the top so that you can incorporate the cable on the, on the plate and fix it on the plate. So these are all one of the good uh, viable options you have when you have a pre-implant fracture. Another thing is the locking attachment plate, which is a definitely a good option. You can attach to any plate anywhere so that the, these, these players screws will circumferentially in, uh, you know, attach on either sides of the implant. And you have a two version four roll eight roll plates like this and the screws going across. It's something like a, you get a bicortical and um, definitely a, a able fixation, stable fixation. And uh, uh, you have a good solid fixation from day one. And this patient can walk and wait bad from day one without much of an issue. And the cable system, as I said earlier, definitely the tried and tested uh, a method of uh, fixation, but um, nowadays, with the, instead of the cable, the, now the circumcision the wire, uh, the stainless steel wire which we use, the uh, cable system is better better option because it, it has a four times the fatigue life, uh, fatigue failure rate, and also it can be clamped and unclamped, and also you can retighten at any point of time without snapping, so which is a definitely a good option in osteoporotic bone. Fixation augmentation of the screws. Uh, there are various screws that have come up now with the hydroxyapatite coating. The AO has got a hydroxyapatite coated the cancellous bone screws, the, cord the cortical bone screws, and even Shanspin has come with the, uh, the, the uh, HA, HA coated Shanspins. And the standard screws, what will happen? The distal, uh, it, it will pull out and uh, the threads becomes loose and uh, slowly the very uh, screw head, the, the peri screw head, you'll see loosening. But here, with the hydroxyapatite, you have a good incorporation and the pull out strength increases as days goes by. And similarly, the shanspin also has got a HA coated shanspin. And if you feel the osteoporotic bone, the fixture, you should always try to use a smaller diameter uh, drill and use a HA coated pin. Probably the pull out will not happen. And uh, the white, there are various white fillers. As I said earlier, the cancerous bone need to be filled. Definitely, there must not be a cavity, otherwise it cannot heal because it heals with the creeping substitution. So the fillers can be a poly, polymethyl methacrylate or a tricalcium phosphate or the simple autographs or allografts or a bone mineral uh, concentrate or, you know, you have a lot of different types of uh, uh, the fillers available. Uh, like a putty uh, or a paste. And here you can see around the, the uh, DHS, the, the tricalcium phosphate has been infiltrated. And <clears throat> this, the, this calcium, tricalcium phosphate augmentation is uh, not only acts like a scaffold, it also it helps in uh, uh, the uh, bone uh, conductive activity as well. So, it is definitely a viable, good option, and it, it gives intrinsic stability on day one, so it, this bone doesn't collapse uh, or you don't lose the, uh, the fixation. So that is very important. And sometimes polymethyl, the, even the metafixia, the cement is used for temper for uh, good augmentation and fixation. Here, this is a very osteoporotic, and where some you feel that you may need to fill this gap with the bone grafts. And if you don't want to you know, harvest the bone, sometimes the tricalcium phosphate uh, definitely is a, is a viable option to fill the gaps. So it doesn't, you don't get, get into problems of shorting of the bone. And the recent, uh, the proximal femoral nails, even the uh, helical blade and the proximal humeral screws have got cannulation and through which you can uh, use the lowest cost cement uh, the PMMA to pump in and you fill these gaps and you have a good stability on day one. Wherever you feel, uh, one of the problems with the locking plate is you may feel that fixation is good because the uh, screw head locks on the plate, but that is that, uh, that may fool you. But uh, you, one, if you feel that the, the screw threads, the initial screw thread which is going in is not of uh, you know, good fixation, and you feel some, some toggling, 
possibly that is a weaker screw and uh, you don't depend on the locking uh, concept alone. You will definitely uh, use the polymethylene metacrylate to augment and you can uh, uh, fill in the uh, void and also increase the grip strength of the screws. So which is a definite option in pedicle screws, uh, proximal femurs and uh, proximal humerus. Similarly, in SI joint, uh, sometimes uh, I use the uh, uh, you know the fixation. If I feel you, I use the thread, use the longer thread. But in spite of that, the bone is too osteoporotic, and you get a head shape fracture of the sacral ala. I sometimes inject the cement through the cannulation, and you get a good rigid fixation. And this patient can walk on from day one without much of an issue. Spinal fractures, I'm just going to touch upon. Uh, not, I'm not going to describe much about the spinal fracture. It's a big topic. It's coming uh, back again. Uh, vertical plasty and kyphoplasty is a different option. Uh, filling the void of the crushed bone with a polymethyl metacrylate uh, using a transpedicular injection of cement with a high pressure in vertical plasty for good pain relief. In kyphoplasty, you insert a balloon, you create a void, and inject, use a low pressure injection and aiming to restore the height. So this is a typical kyphoplasty. You restore the height and then fill the with the cement. Um, so you restore the height and also the patient gets immediate pain relief, which is uh, definitely a good idea. And the <clears throat> uh, if, if you see the efficacy of uh, both, bo uh, both functionally uh, have a better pain relief. But the kyphoplasty has got a, a better evidence of uh, functional outcome compared to the vertebroplasty. And also the correction in kyphoplasty is restored very well uh, compared to the uh, vertebroplasty. And the AOS definitely says that uh, strongly recommends uh, the use of kyphoplasty rather than vertebroplasty for treatment of uh, uh, compressed uh, uh, vertebral fractures, especially osteoporotic compression fractures. We're not talking about the pathological or secondaries in the spine. Um, so to conclude my talk, um, so the, you need to treat the patient as a whole. That is very important. So keeping the patient alive, treating the acute medical management, because the, more, the mortality in these patients are very high in the first one year. So you need to keep them up and about at the earliest. So your fixation must be strong enough and you need to meet all the surgical challenges which you may face. And you need to make them to be mobile on day one and return to their activity at the earliest possible. And these patients should not come back to you again with another osteoporotic fracture. So the treatment of osteoporosis must be simultaneously started. And looking at the risk factors, you need to uh, give a rigorous treatment. And uh, if you do a uh, you know, proper assessment, a multidisciplinary approach, and a good surgical technique, uh, definitely the secondary, uh, second fractures or you know, the mortality of these patients have becomes very, very less. So thank you very much uh, for patiently listening. Thank you, one, one and all. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, such a lucid talk. Uh, almost uh, all things are covered about the problems of the uh, fixation. Uh, now, uh, we have planned one case in between. After the three talks, we will be taking the case. If Vikas Agashya, sir, is ready with the case, we can take. Uh, sir, unmute you. I am ready. Yeah, yeah. So Thank you. Uh, we'll Thank you. we'll take an interesting case. Uh, okay. Vikas Agarwal sir will present the case. Sir is our mentor for all this uh, osteoporosis month. Last time also he has presented his uh, talk. Excellent. And now uh, interesting case by Sir Agarwal sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just to break the monotony, we yeah. thought we will have an interactive case discussion. So uh, this is. Uh, a case where I have a follow-up of almost 20 plus years. A middle-aged man had slowly increasing vague pain all over the body and myalgia. He consulted an orthopedic surgeon in 1999. This is almost 22 years ago. And uh, the bone density was done at that time. The T-score was minus 3 in the spine, minus 2.8 in the hip. So he was appropriately treated at that time with cholecalciferol, calcitriol, calcium, and alendronate. Unfortunately, he did not improve. And in fact, he started worsening. 
So he was referred to a rheumatologist in early 2000 for possibly rheumatoid arthritis. The rheumatoid, rheumatologist got some basic investigations done. The reports were as follows. His phosphorus was 1.9. His calcium was 9.8. His vitamin D was 40. His PTH was 50. So within normal limits. Alkaline phosphatase was 232. CBCSR was within normal limits. Creatinine was 1. So since we are going to have an a interactive session, I would like to know why did he refer him to an endocrinologist? Can anyone guess why was he referred? With these investigations, the rheumatologist almost diagnosed this and sent him to an endocrinologist. So can anyone suggest why and what should be done? See, all these body pains are labeled as myalgia. Huh. And uh, uh, when the myalgia is there, body pain is there, they are always referred to rheumatologist. If you don't find any cause and if the patient is uh, uh, not getting any relief from any treatment, <laughs> as, a, as a last resort, they are sent right. to rheumatologist. Right. Yes, but the rheumatologist diagnosed this as a disease, but not rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. So yeah. the, the, the pass press level is very low. Correct. So uh, that we have to rule out some endocrine abnormalities. Like, we have to further investigate further. What would you suggest? We have to... We have to Go ahead. Yeah, we have to we have to look into high, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. The, and also look into some other endocrine problems like uh, <coughs> pituitary. You have to rule out pituitary problems and thyroid problems also. Right. Thyroid also. Correct. Correct. Now, thyroid levels were normal, hmm. so the endocrinologist started some treatment. He had about fifty percent improvement. So again, what kind of what was his diagnosis? Yeah, I'm coming to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> any, any, any inputs now? Now he has started treatment, which is a very funny treatment, and giving clues, which is a very funny treatment, very very funny treatment, and patient had about fifty percent improvement. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to. Change serious atmosphere. All, Let it be little lively. It's all a guesswork. <laughs> okay, I will give the next clue. Oh. Um, a medicine which is normally given per rectum was given orally. A medicine which Can it be? is normally Can given. Axel? Can it Sorry. be? For the enema. Yes. Sangeet, you are not supposed to answer because <laughs> you know the case. Yeah, Sangeet yeah. is not supposed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Proctocles enema was given. Now can you diagnose? Can it be a malabsorption syndrome? No. Anything else? Yeah, any liver problem? Sorry? Any liver liver disease? Liver. No. No. Magnesium. Okay. Phosphate so, was high and phosphorus was low. Correct. So, the case of renal osteodystrophy, hypophosphatemic type. Perfect. So, uh, this is classical hypophosphatemic osteomalacia or rickets. It is diagnosed by checking what is called phosphate clearance ratio. So, serum creatinine by upon urinary creatinine multiplied by urinary phosphorus upon serum phosphorus. It should be, normally it's about 5. What are they Up to 10 is suspicious. More than 10 is diagnostic. So the treatment is Proctocles enema orally. There are 3 or 4 different types of phosphate uh, supplements. Basically our body, uh, our diet contains adequate phosphate. So it is never phosphate deficiency like calcium deficiency. It is generally the phosphorus which is not reabsorbed by the tubules. 
and therefore they develop this problem. So the uh, phosphate supplements are Dawa Bajar mein you can get phosphorus powder. Unfortunately, the patient has to keep making phosphate mixtures every day and has to take it three times a day. And that's not a really good, easy, easy solution. Phosphorus, uh, proctoclis enema contains high phosphate. And therefore, you can give uh, proctoclis enema. Patient gets sort of diarrhea, even when you take orally. They really get bored. And, but still, that is uh, was a method till about four years ago. Four years ago, now an Indian company has come up with a phosphate tablet, which are reasonably cheap. So this is where we are now. This is in 2004-2005. Again, Sangeet is not supposed to answer. Okay. And I think Abhijit also, Abhijit also has seen this case during the <laughs> US meeting. So phosphate level, though he was subjectively improving, except one... Otherwise, the phosphate levels always remain uh, below the baseline. And he was generally okay, but not very high. February 2006, he developed pain and swelling in the knee and presented to an orthopedic surgeon. The serum phosphorus 1.7. Again, everything else was almost similar. This is, you can see it was reported as a giant cell tumor. His FNAC was performed twice and report was inconclusive. So in 2006, he consulted me with severe myalgia, pain in the rib cage, pain all over the body. And for last eight years, he had persistent, pain was persisting and increasing in spite of treatment. <laughs> and has pain in the knee for nine months. So what should I do now? I think you need to investigate for uh, the parathyroid adenoma. Yes, we checked that. It did not show any parathyroid adenoma. So I have a patient with low phosphorus, temporarily, partially relieved of his symptoms by phosphate supplementation. But now, of late, he is uncomfortable and has a tumor in upper end TBA. Have you tried parathermal injection? No, we haven't. We haven't. Question is, why should you think of hyperparathyroidism? Sorry, hypo hyperparathyroidism when PTS levels are normal is what we were thinking. That was our line of thinking. So I'll go further. A quite unusual case. Any any other opinion? Uh, biopsy, biopsy of the lesion. Biopsy done twice, which the report was inconclusive. FNAC was done twice, report was inconclusive. So, we have a tumor in the patient of, in a patient of hypophosphatemic osteomalacia rickets. The first thing that should come to our mind is tumor-induced osteomalacia. These hypophosphatemic rickets are often because of a tumor. You excise the tumor, the hypophosphatemic rickets settles. So these are very rare mesenchymal tumors. They can be anywhere in the body. Very often they are soft tissue tumors. And in a patient who has recent, in a, uh, he develops hypophosphatemic rickets in middle age. One should think of a tumor and one should actually examine in great details because very often these tumors are on the body. A small lipoma-like thing you will find. You exercise that and they settle. So I'll go further. We did a bone scan. There was a solitary hotspot of upper end tibia where there was a tumor. So these are rare syndrome associated with benign mesenchymal tumors. They are associated with resistant hypophosphatemia. The pathogenesis is believed to be secretion of what is called phosphaturic factor or FGF23 along with inhibition of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme in the kidney. 
it basically it causes excessive excretion of phosphate or prevents resorption of phosphate so the diagnostic parameters are low serum phosphorus increased urinary phosphorus normal serum calcium low serum 125 dihydroxy d3 normally what we check is a 25 hydroxy d3 because that actually represents the body stores of vitamin d we hardly ever check 125 d3 in this case you need to check 125 d3 normal 25 d3 normal pth serum no, raised serum alkaline phosphatase and then a technician bone scan may pick up these things in 2006 we did not have the pet or optotride scan and also the uh, uh, the classic uh, diagnostic test of fgf 23 levels now they are available but those days we did not have that so this really fitted into a uh, tumor induced osteomalacia and this was a well encapsulated tumor so that's the we decided not to do a biopsy we decided to excise it and stabilize it because it was a large tumor and we thought that he will develop a fracture so we excised the biopsy scar that's the large uh, uh, cavity so we scrape send it for frozen section we did burring and then put iliac crest grafts and bone substitutes as you can see here and stabilized it with a medial t locking plate that 3.5 upper tibial locking plate was not available then it is available now so this is a vascular tumor with bone filled spaces with evidence of new bone formation and matrix full of spindle cell shells and multi nucleated giant cells you can see these cells are classic spindle shaped cells and then immediately he had significant clinical improvement on fifth day so phosphate mixture dose decrease symptoms settled well calcitriol supplements decrease six months post op he was very comfortable his phosphorus level increased and at 9 months he is much better he is walking without support at 7 years post op very comfortable patient 11 years he sent me a mail thank you very much i am good all blood values are okay except for phosphorus which is bit low i am glad to get this mail from you hope you are doing well now if you want to spoil your good results have a good follow up because last month i received this mail <laughs> sir i am very uncomfortable i have severe pain in hip joints waist lower and upper back and neck during movements there is no body balance i have difficulty in walking standing sitting and bending and rolling now sangeet and abhijit can you suggest what should i do so again check the calcium metabolism And yes. now, how old did the patient? Now he is around two thousand six. He was thirty nine. So now he is. Now, now you can go for PET yeah. scan, sir. Now you can go uh, for PET scan. Yeah, PET scan again. Yes, PET scan. Correct. So now we can do FGF twenty three to mm -hmm. actually decide whether he has a recurrence or not. So the phosphorus, you can see. has gone down suddenly phosphorus has gone down suddenly calcium is normal 25 hydrox is normal creatinine is normal pth is normal but fgf 23 has increased significantly so it is up to about 160 or 200 is normal in 2013 it was slightly raised and then in between we did not do any test because he was subjectively quite all right and then 2021 we repeated it has shot to 900 or 1000 so 
we are dealing with recurrence. So uh, these are the references. In fact, we have published this paper in Journal of European Society of Endocrinology, Endocrine Collect Connections. Uh, Tumor-induced osteomalacia experience from three tertiary care centers in India, from PGI, uh, Ames, and uh, Hinduja Hospital. Sorry, Tagore Medical College, Udaipur, and Hinduja Hospital. So we had 30 cases with a mean age of 39, bone pains and proximal myopathy. 40% had fractures. Tumors clinically detected in four patients of 22. In 25 cases, tumors were detected. We excised it in 22 with a mean delay or in diagnosis of 3.8 years. In 16 cases, they were mesenchymal tumors. Three cases, hemangiopericytomas. Two, GCT, one, hemangioma. We had cure only in 72% cases. 28% did not have cure. And 10% had a recurrence. Now, to, this will be another recurrence. So, French osteoporosis is a definition. Classic osteoporosis is a definition of uh, uh, if you rule out all other causes, then this is classic osteoporosis. We must always, like Dr. Kulkarni showed, so many cases where they were supposedly osteoporosis, but the real cause was different. So it is essentially for demographic studies. It is not a threshold for therapeutic interventions. And after 1990 of change definition, it is primary osteoporosis and we must rule out secondary osteoporosis of osteomalacia, endocrine disorders and malignancy. So essentially most of the osteomalacias respond to vitamin D and calcium. Those that are not responding to D and calcium, low phosphorus, you must take an endocrine help because it is beyond us. It is beyond us. I did not diagnose this. It is the endocrinologist who diagnosed and told me, Ki, yeah, sir, do this. I, it was beyond me. So then, if there is a high calcium with low phosphorus and high PTH with normal creatinine, it is hyperparathyroidism. There are some other rare causes and then it could be hypophosphatemic osteomalacia with low phosphorus normal calcium, creatinine, vitamin D3 and PTH. If it is early age, then it is genetic. Then they are short statured and they generally do not have tumor. If it occurs in middle age, then it is a late presentation search for TIO or tumor induced osteomalacia. Here FGF23 is raised. They have low 125D3. They have normal 25 OHD3 and then you should do either octreotide scan which is very specific but it is very expensive. Costs almost 80,000 rupees and uh, uh, because the material has to be brought in first. We could al also do PET because most often PET can pick up these tumors. Otherwise till then phosphate supplements need to be given and most often the Early age group settles with, they don't settle, they need phosphorus supplements all their life. Thank you, friends. Hmm. Hi. Thank you. Great. A great case. A very, very, very great very, case. Very interesting case and very interesting. Uh, interactive, interactive discussion was also enlightening. Wonderful documentation. Sorry, Sangeet. Sorry, Sangeet, I cut you. Cut you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I we, understand, sir. Uh, even though uh, we had heard it before, it was again a refresh. Yes, yeah. uh, so we'll go to the fourth talk now. Uh, Problems of fracture healing in osteoporotic bones uh, by Dr. Yash Jakish from Trichy. So I request him to talk, uh, start with his talk. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Respectfully, you know, President Professor Anthony Vimalraj. Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. 
ஜுவல் <laughs> More than 200 million people around the world are affected by the osteoporosis. Bones are become weak and brittle. There is an increased susceptibility of the fractures. So fracture healing is same as in young individuals, but the healing is prolonged because of the osteoclastic activity in the elderly osteoporotic individuals. In 60 to 60 years, there is a loss of 0.6% of bone mass every year in the age group between the 70 and 79 in women there is a loss of 1.1% of bone mass every year more than 80 years of the age in women there is a loss of 2.1% every year the fracture occurrence is more common in women there is a percentage of 40 to 45% as compared to the men they have got a 15 to 25 27% the risk factors for osteoporosis are reduced absorption of the calcium and increased parathyroid hormone levels and reduced calcitonin levels nutritional risk factors are low calcium intake high alcohol and caffeine intake high sodium and animal protein intake women are more commonly suffering due to the osteoporosis there is also familial prevalence and high concordance seen in the monozygotic twins and smoking living in indoors and poor exposure to sun can also produce versus the osteoporosis drugs like glucocorticoids anti epileptic drugs cases like rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes mellitus can also produce versus to the osteoporosis The bone mass density measurement is essential to diagnose the osteoporotic condition. It is mostly done by dual energy x-ray absorption metry. It is a reliable, accurate method for the bone density determination with the very little radiation. It can be done in lumbar spine, proximal femur and whole body. So ultrasound can be used, in a high, used at the high risk population. and also the another modality is quantitative ct it can be done in any region in our body who classified the osteoporosis into three categories it is determined by the t score in normal individual it is minus 1 or greater if the patient presents with low bone mass the t score between minus 1 to minus 2.5 in osteoporotic individual the t score will be minus 2.5 or below minus 2.5 in case of severe osteoporosis the t score should be minus 2.5 presenting with a fragility fracture so the t score is a division value of standard deviation of difference between the patient's bone mass density and n normal bone mass density by the standard deviation of n population The score groups mean is zero, and the variance variance is one. Greater the osteoporosis in incre- increases, the T score is decreases. There is a fracture healing depends on synergy between the biomechanical, molecular, cell and cellular factors. The so activation of the mesenchymal stem cells and release of the growth regulatory factors. associated with the three ideal conditions like adequate blood supply good contact between the bone fragments and the good stability will go for the good fracture healing the so peter gionides introduced the fracture healing as the diamond concept 
So fracture healing is a complex physiological process. So fracture healing is by bone restoration, regeneration that includes the utilization of the growth factors and scaffolds and the mesenchymal stem cells. That is the triangular concept of bone healing, fracture healing. But the fourth concept was introduced by the Ibanides, that is the mechanical stability of the fracture that is very important that can be achieved by the surgical stabilization. The fracture healing in osteoporotic fracture, whether it is different, it is not like that. The fracture healing is prolonged in the osteoporotic individual because of the altered bone mineral composition, altered bone mineral content and the crystallinity. The poor bone quality in patients with osteoporosis presents the surgeon with difficult treatment decision. So he concluded that the influence of osteoporosis on fracture healing have not yet been clarified and the clinical evidence is still lacking. The four basic processes of newborn formation are osteochondral ossification, intramembranous ossification, oppositional newborn formation, and osteonal migration that is called the creeping substitution. The fracture healing is a complex process. In the fracture hematoma, the fibroblasts, macrophages, and chondroblasts getting deposited that is induced with the osteoblast and the osteoclast that leads to the callus formation. In the expression of the appropriate genes by the matrix production, organization of the hematoma, and the growth factor and transcription factor stimulation that goes for factor healing and the remodeling. The clinical union defined as a mineralization process around the fracture site that is progress that gives the progressively increasing stiffness and the strength. The fracture becomes stable and the pain free. The radiological union, the bony trabacle or cortical bone crossing the fracture site. The Yain Horn described the four distinct healing processes occurs in the bone marrow, cortex, periosteum, and the external soft tissues. The periosteal response leads to callus formation by the committed osteoprogenitor cells, undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, and recapitalization of the embryonic intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. Periosteal response is a rapid response following the fracture. The external soft tissue response is a rapid cellular activity, development of the early bridging callus, and through the endochondral ossification, it stabilizes the fracture fragments and promotes the healing. The fracture healing is divided into anabolic phase and the catabolic phase. In anabolic phase, there is an inflammatory phase and chondrogenetic and angiogenetic phase. Inflammatory phase that starts after 24 hours after the injury that is initiated by the innate immune response by periosteum transforming growth factor, platelet derived growth factors initiate the healing process. Differentiation of the stem cells, skeletal and the vascular tissue removal of the necrotic tissue at the edge of the bone. That is the, in the inflammatory phase following the fracture. Next phase is a chondrogenetic phase. It starts three days after the injury. Formation of the cartilaginous callus adjacent to the fracture line and swelling of the periosteum at the edges of the new cartilage. Initiation of the primary bone formation and formation of the nascent blood vessels by the angiogenetic cells differentiation of the chondrocytes and mineralization of the cartilaginous extracellular matrix and chondrocyte apoptosis. The next phase is a catabolic phase that is the 14 days after the injury. There is a reduction in the tissue volume initiated by the recruiting resorptive osteoclasts and reduction in the callus size, resorption of the secondary bone and remodeling to the original particle structures. Regression of the vascular bed and the regeneration of the hemopoietic tissue, re establishment of the bone marrow and vascular flow, flow rate at the original level. This phase we can allow partial or full weight bearing mobility and patient can, can gain the functional recovery. <laughs> the fractures, the stimulation of the fracture healing is very essential. 
The most common method of simulation is by bone grafting. The common bone grafting we are use is autogenous bone graft. It can be used alone from the harvester from the iliac crust. It has got a properties of the osteoconductive, osteoinductive, and osteogenic property. The other one is a allograft. It can be used alone or in combination. It can be a phase dried bone or demineralized bone matrix. It has also got a property of osteoconductive, osteoinductive. And factor based simulation, it is used in combination recombinant human bone morphogenic protein 2 and the protein 7 are used for the stimulation of fracture healing. It has got a property of osteoinductive. <coughs> the cell based Stimulation is by mesenchymal stem cells. It has got a property of the osteogenic property. And ceramic based stimulation can be used alone or in combination with the autograph. The material used are tricalcium phosphate, calcium sulfate, and bioactive glass. It has got a property of the osteoconductive. Polymer can be also used for stimulation. It is a non degradable or biodegradable polymers. It has got a property of the osteoconductive and miscellaneous material like coralline hydroxy appetite can be also used for stimulation of the fracture healing in osteoporosis. It has got a property of osteoconductive. So another method is a bone marrow aspirate concentrate. It can be aspirated from the iliac crust. It is delivering the osteogenic cells directly into the regeneration site. It contains the mesenchymal stem cells and the growth factors and improves the fracture healing in the osteoporosis. <coughs> so another method is a reamer aspirator irrigator. It is originally used to decrease the intramedullary pressure and fat embolism in fracture fixation. 25 to 90 ml of bone marrow aspirate for the grafting is available. The aspirate is rich of mesenchymal stem cells, platelet derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, insulin like growth factor, and latent transforming growth factor. It also stimulates the wound healing at the osteoporotic fracture site. We can also use electromagnetic stimulation. It was described in 1970s for non-union and delayed union. It has got a success rate of 64 to 85%. In vitro exposure of the electromagnetic stimulation to the osteoblast that leads to secretion of the bone morphogenic protein 2 and bone morphogenic protein 4 and transforming growth factors and insulin growth factor 2 that promotes the fracture healing. Ultrasound stimulation also used in the fracture healing in osteoporosis, that is the low intensity ultrasound that increases the incorporation of calcium ions in the cartilage and the cell culture. It stimulates the expression of numerous genes involved in the healing process. There is a early onset N-condral ossification seen in the animal studies following use of the low intensity ultrasound. It also increases the healing process in the smokers, diabetes and vascular insufficiency osteoporoid and chronic steroid in intake related osteoporotic fractures. So another hormone is used in simulation of the fracture healing is parathyroid hormone. It is a naturally occurring hormone, modulates the mineral homeostasis. There is a chondrocyte and osteoblast proliferation, a delayed chondrocyte hypertrophy and increased coupled remodeling is seen. It increases the torsional strength and stiffness bone mineral content, bone mineral density, and cartilage volume in the osteoporotic fractures. Increased callus size and accelerated fracture union can be also seen following the parathyroid hormone therapy. The fourth important factor in diamond concept of fracture healing is the mechanical stability. So mechanical fixation can be used along with osteoconductive scaffolds, growth factors, osteogenic mesenchymal stem cells. So mechanical stability that produces the local vascularization, angiogenesis during the bone regeneration, it should be done with a minimal disruption of the blood supply. The factors negatively affect the bone healing are smoking, alcoholism, 
non steroid anti inflammatory drugs ibuprofen brufen fluoroquinolone antibiotics calcium channel blockers diabetes and age above 80 years and malignant disorders pulmonary insufficiency and immunodeficiency so we have to maintain the good nutrition and the bone health to heal the osteoporotic fracture we must take the balanced diet which should be rich of nutrients minerals and the vitamins adequate dietary intake of calcium is essential for fracture healing reduced intake of calcium can lead leads to osteolysis of the bone and calcium should be essential for maintaining the homeostasis absorption of the calcium usually around the 30% milk and dietary products are best source of calcium the other sources are spinach broccoli almonds legumes and the seafood consumption of the oxalic acid phytic acid that inhibits the calcium absorption we must also able to know the calcium content in the different foods the one cup of milk that contains 290 mg of calcium half cup of canned milk that contains 329 mg one cup of yogurt that contains 320 mg of calcium grilled cheese of 30 g contains 300 mg and parmesan cheese of 30 mg that contains the 414 mg so vitamin d is also essential for the fracture healing it is a calciferol fat soluble cyclosterol it available in two forms hydrocalciferol and colocalciferol the food rich, rich in vitamin d are egg liver fish and the cereals we must take along with our regular diet so vitamin d content in different foods in cod liver oil there is a 400 international units of vitamin d is available and cooked salmon fish of 100 g that contains 360 international units of vitamin d and the herring cooked food contains 600 international units and tuna food that is 200 one cup of milk contains the 100 international units of vitamin d fish is also a rich source of calcium like salmon sardine and swordfish and mackerel fish it contains the omega 3 fatty acid that is the epa and dha those fatty acids lower the serum concentration levels of the prostaglandin e2 and the interleukin 1 those uh, thing are uh, prevents the osteolysis in the bone we must also take the fruits and vegetables rich of potassium magnesium iron zinc that increases the healing process by increasing the bone mass density vitamin c folic acid niacin essential elements of hydroxylation of the bone it is they, these are all essential elements of the hydroxylation of the bone collagen so regular intake of vegetables containing vitamin a vitamin k b12 that improves the bone healing in the osteoporosis so to summarize this talk osteoporotic and fracture healing is by the diamond concept that is by the deposition of the mesenchymal stem cells growth factors and scaffolds along with the mechanical stability so osteoporosis healing is by stimulation of the stimulation of the bone bone growth can be done by bone marrow aspirate concentrate autogenous ileo graft recombinant human bone morphogenic protein and parathyroid hormone electromagnetic and the ultrasound stimulation high intake of calcium and vitamin d foods so thank you for your patient attention thank you very much sir for a nice and elaborate talk uh, factors uh, which are affecting the healing of the bone uh, osteoporotic bone especially uh, now we will move on to the uh, next talk uh, which is by dr balaji asigaukar uh, he will be talking on the problems of fitness of patient in osteoporotic fracture dr balaji asigaukar is an eminent anesthesiologist in aurangabad he is basically a cardiac anesthesiologist and uh, he is a very good orator at present he is a, a secretary of the isa maharashtra state branch and he is a very social person also he has his own Uh, NGO Sneha Sauli, uh, where he is doing uh, social work and supporting the geriatric patients and taking all care of medical and all uh, aspects. And he is a very good orator also. 
So now I introduce Dr. Balaji Asegaukar and I request him to talk on the very important aspect of the osteoporotic fractures, uh, fitness of the patient for surgery because if patient is fit, we can go ahead with our all the uh, surgeries. Balaji, over to Balaji, please. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind introduction. And I'm really happy to come on this diet. And I'm really thankful to Arthur Society uh, for inviting me on this topic. I listen all the lectures and it's really very wonderful activity to watch as well as listen. So today's my topic is problem of fitness for surgery in osteoporotic patients. Uh, we have already... Um, even though I have prepared this uh, slide, it has been repeated many times that overall, as you seen that overall incidence of uh, there is aging population, particularly uh, even in our country. And day by day, we are getting many uh, fragile fracture uh, people to operate. And uh, as you know, nowadays that uh, everyone want very urgent surgical intervention and it is rightly uh, prove that uh, early surgical intervention uh, decreases the most of the morbidity and even to mortality to a large ex extent. And as such, there is very minimal time for to optimize the patients, particularly fracture neck femur or uh, uh, this fragility fracture patients who require at the earliest they want uh, we want to go with the intervention. Now, in this scenario, how we should evaluate the patient or what things that can be optimizable that uh, I'm going to talk in the next 20 minutes. So the, my aim of presentation will be how to assess in you know, a patient, then how we can go with quick optimization, some anesthesia consideration or some pearls about anesthesia management, something, one or two slides about post-op pain management, and how can we uh, prevent uh, the complication in this scenario? So as far as problems of pre-anesthesia consultation is uh, concerned, uh, as an anesthesiologist, I would like to assess as soon as uh, at the earliest when our patients is, uh, come to us, because at least some duration we will get to optimize that patients and while assessing these patients they, we have got multiple problems apart from that uh, uh, fracture patient may have sustained other injuries so we have to look for other injury whether there is the presence of head injury or any fracture uh, there is injury to his spine then these are as geriatric patients uh, uh, it's nowadays dementia depression hearing difficulties and even a post stroke patients these are very very common things nowadays and they are on multiple medications they have got associated neurological problems pulmonary problems cardiac morbidities even they are uh, most of the time bedridden their hydration status is not trouble they have bladder bubble problem they might have uh, even a, a bed source or maybe a sepsis many a times in geriatric patient it's a sepsis presentation is not like a normal uh, presentation of increased fever a patient has got a fever or increased tlc on the contrary change in mentation can be the presentation in sepsis patient so we have to look for all these uh, problems whenever you are assessing the patients as far as pulmonary risk assessment is concerned, all these patients have got a very decreased pulmonary reserve. They can have a COPD. The patient can be in an early respiratory failure. The patient can have a pneumonia, aspiration. And if at all we put them as patients on a ventilator, they are very difficult to win. But in general, if you think any patient who has got a room air saturation is below 90%, those patients who has got a low hemoglobin in pulmonary function test uh, less than 50% of uh, FEV1 than predicted or decreased forced vital capacity. These are the very, very high risk patient as far as pulmonary complications are concerned. And we hardly have a chance, but still we can start them on nebulization, nebulizers, bronchodilators. We can, if patient is cooperative, his cognitive functions are better, then we can start with incentive spirometry. So we have to assess the risk and whatever change that we can do, that we have to start acting on it. Now, cardiac risk uh, assessment, there are a number of cardiac diseases that can be present to a patient, like from hypertension, ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, early heart failure, which is not recognized or even labeled. 
presence of arrhythmia, even effort tolerance is very difficult to judge because patients is hardly watching, uh, hardly walking. Uh, we need to do ECG, echocardiography to assess all these things and uh, see what things are present in the patient. In general, the optimizable things could be the control of hypertension. If patient is in early failure, we can go ahead with the smaller doses of diuretics. We have to maintain the electrolytes, see for sodium, uh, serum sodium, because it is directly related with mentation of the patient or serum electro uh, potassium, which is directly, uh, if there is hypokalemia, patient's heart is very irritable, particularly in a scen scenario of myocardial infarction or uh, whether this patient is on uh, we can start antiarrhythmic if patient has got an active arrhythmias. As far as neurological assessment is concerned, in cognitive, cognitive dysfunction is very common in geriatric patients, particularly on the contrary, those bedridden patients are more osteoporotic. On the patients of dementia, Alzheimer, patient of delirium, old or recent stroke patient, Parkinsonism patient. So we have to assess what is the present condition of the patient and what, what factors had lead to this present condition. Then we have to assess how much is the power in the leaves. Spine examination is very, very important because unrecognized spine fracture is very common and we want to suppose give original anesthesia. So we must document this spine, uh, this presence of uh, neuro neurological assessment is very, very important. Now, apart from that, other comorbidities like diabetes is again very common. Drug history is extremely important. Now, this corona pandemic, we have seen patients on very high dosage of stuff. What are the drugs, particularly for CVS, whether patient is on anti whether patient is on anti uh, central neural diseases, then one must look vitals. Vitals are very important. One, one must look it personally. It's not when one should not go with the uh, round written on the paper. You must assess personally how much is the heart rate, blood pressure, saturation, and respirator. Even these four vitals are normal. It's a very big thing in a geriatric patient. This heart rate, blood pressure, saturation, and respiratory rate. So spine examination, I already told, one has to look for bed sore. We are going to give a spinal to this patient. And if there is a bed sore, then we may be in a problem. And in history taking also, or during examination, try to evaluate the pain tolerance of the patient. Some patients are extremely intolerant to pain. And some patients are uh, can tolerate pain in a better way. So our strategy changes as per this. So it is very important to evaluate the patient's pain tolerance in pre-op period. Then as far as quick optimization is concerned, one can check electrolytes and we can optimize serum sodium, potassium. Kidney function tests are very important as anesthesiologists because many, all anesthetic agents are excreted to kidney. If, uh, there is a deranged kidney function or liver function. This uh, effect of these drugs is prolonged and patient may not uh, uh, come out early or there will be a delayed recovery. Unnoticed, Hypoglycemia, hypovolemia uh, is also a very, very common situation. Even though it looks, it's uh, not, uh, uh, you may presume that it is not very common, but I have seen it so many times. Patients is severely hypovolemic or patient is in sepsis, as I already told you. These conditions must be uh, optimized whenever you are posting the patient for any surgery. Uh, if possible, we can start with, as I already stated, nebulization, then antihypertensive immunity, small doses of high diuretics if patient saturation is uh, 90, 93, and patient is having a diastolic heart failure. Many times on echo, ejection fraction is normal, but patient have got a diastolic uh, heart failure or diastolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction is very uh, dangerous entity to be have in a perioperative period. They are very difficult patient to manage in perioperative period. And it is most many a times neglected entity. So one must look for echo in a um, echo completely. And if there is a diastolic dysfunction and signs of failure, one must treat it. Then electrolytes must be looked and again, sepsis must be managed of starting. As far as anesthesia uh, is concerned, one must document, uh, take consent. Many a times patient is in dementia or patient in al Alzheimer. 
so consent from patient may not be possible so risk should be explained to relative kin relative and it should be taken on paper proper documentation of the mentation of the patient in pre operative period is very important we don't aim that patient should come to a normal mentation but whatever his mentation at the time before surgery that will be must achieve after anesthesia or surgery now level of care now more the sicker the patient is it is better to operate in a multi speciality where there is a uh, support of icu it's a, a severely osteoporotic patient with multiple comorbidities it is preferable to avoid at nursing home care because this patient may can any time go into post op delirium or any other complications are so very common to the patient so level of care you must decide when you are pre operatively evaluating these patients in um, uh, in uh, with close discussion with uh, the treating surgeon now level of monitoring as an anesthesiologist suppose uh, patient is very sick he has got a multiple comorbidity i will always go for a higher level of monitoring apart from our non invasive blood pressure cvp or uh, pulse oximetry you must put central lines to many at times to patient because this central line gives you a very good uh, chance to maneuver the hemodynamics of the patient you can give fluids you can start inotropes there is no uh, means you can monitor the cvp so level of monitoring should be enhanced as per the uh, severity of the patient or as per the critical criticality of the patients the important uh, aim during perioperative period is avoid hypotension even a episode of uh, hypotension for more than 20 minutes mean arterial pressure decrease more than 75 uh, less than 75 for more than 20 minutes can cause uh aki acute kidney injury or can cause uh, post op delirium to the patient can alter the mentation of the patient so avoiding hypotension whichever anesthesia you may be given but the aim is to maintain the uh, pre op level blood pressure of the patients then maintain hemoglobin more the patient is more sicker in many a times there is a conservative approach about blood transfusion that our aim is to maintain hemoglobin of 8 it's uh, Uh, good for normal patients but when patient is of ischemic heart disease patient has got a renal function compromise patient is very old age here the target of hemoglobin should be more and we should not hesitate to give blood even in a pre op period so maintaining a, at least hemoglobin of 10 should be a aim the more the sicker the patient is we must aim patient uh, should be pay, uh, maintained in a very uh, pain free environment when as soon as you patient feels pain or patient uh, suffer from terrible pain during perioperative period there are high chance that patient mo- must go in a post operative delirium phase so while even suppose fracture neck femur you want to cure spinal before that just give femoral nerve block uh, nowadays sonography machines are available in so many theaters just give one uh, simple uh, femoral nerve block and then make the patient sit and give anesthesia it will decrease his pain and overall uh, it will improve the corp- uh, cooperation of the patient not only that it has been proven that lesser the pain uh, in perioperative period the chances of complications are also very uh, decreases uh, now which anesthesia to be given should we give regional anesthesia central anesthesia regional anesthesia is definitely a preferred choice because patients we are not intervening his, his respiratory system we are not Uh, giving him hemodynamic challenges but many times regional anesthesia may be difficult to give because patient may be on anti uh, platelets dual anti platelets or patient may be on anti coagulant so we have to think of general anesthesia but whatever anesthesia you may give our aim is to maintain his hemodynamics to the optimum level if you maintain the good hemodynamics whatever uh, the anesthesia you are giving it is uh, patient's outcome is always good now combining regional and general is also a very good concept nowadays they give spinal as well as general anesthesia low dose spinal so if you give this this is also very beneficial and you can uh, um, many anesthesiologists start trying this combined regional and general anesthesia Uh, as already uh, discussed to uh, some extent bone cement implantation syndrome there should be a very close communication between uh, 
surgeon as well as uh, anesthesiologist when uh, about bone cement implantation and anesthesiologist must be a very aggressive uh, in managing this uh, bone cement implantation uh, complications uh, that is why i was telling uh, patient we should have a central line suppose there is a sudden hypotension and reaction to this bone cement implantation we can deal with uh, such scenarios when we are uh, monitoring the patient in a more uh, in a better way so uh, one anesthetist should must uh, aggressively treat this bone cement implantation syndrome now post op pain management again we more rely on multimodal analgesia rather than giving boluses of uh, opioids nsaid many times this patient has got deranged kidney so we cannot give nsaid patient cementation may affect if you give post avoid uh, opioids in larger dosage because it causes post op delirium very common with uh, higher dosage of opioids so we more believe uh, we should give multimodal means like drugs like paracetamol local blocks nowadays we can insert catheter in uh, femoral block or uh, supraclavic block block use abundant local anesthetic in a diluted form and <clears throat> in this way you can decrease the post op pain management and actively counsel the patient about the uh, if patient's mentation is good patient is understandable uh, patient can uh, comprehend whatever you are telling always do pre op counseling about pain management this is very very important and uh, patients benefit a lot when you are counsel patient tell him about procedure telling about the severity of pain so as far as prevention of a complication the mantra is uh, just go slow while you are even in shifting patient can uh, sustain fractures these are se severely osteoporotic patients so do everything very slowly and gradually uh, and in severely uh, in uh, uh, geriatric patients less is more rule is less is more very small dosage of drugs must be used very uh, you should uh, give the drug see the response and if there is less response you can increase the dose but don't give boluses of uh, sedatives anesthetic agent because they have profound complications during perioperative period then dvt prophylaxis you uh, use whatever the best possible is available and all dvt pump uh, mobilization try to early mobilize low molecular weight heparin at the earliest so this is very very important and delirium prevention as i already told you a uh, certain anesthetic drug can cause delirium avoid hypotension maintain his electrolytes this delirium is very dangerous situation in post op period if uh, you might have seen it once it happens it's very difficult to treat and ambulate this patient at the earliest by doing surgery and um, so that all the complications can be uh, minimized I again thanks orthopedic society for inviting me to talk on this topic thank you very much thank you very much dr balaji for this lucid talk most of the concepts are now clear and uh, it is very important to go slow as you said and it is very important also to be vigilant throughout the day because uh, the chances of uh, survival uh, margin is very less in uh, as it is in pediatric patient in geriatric patients also the margin of uh, plus minus is very less so we, are, we must be always vigilant while taking care of geriatric patients and there are specially ortho geriatric uh, wards now the concept is coming in india also about the ortho geriatrics so and it is a multidisciplinary approach where anesthesia role of anesthesiologist is also very important so thank you very much for uh, your talk now we are in, entering into the last talk of this uh, seminar osteoporosis and orthopedic uh, medical solutions to the orthopedic fractures dr jan thanapan from madurai i request sir to talk uh, uh, start his talk and if possible we will take the case of dr gordon ingle or other else Uh, we'll escape that because gordon is also not available and uh, time is also uh, uh, running short so if i am permits we will take the case of dr gordon so this is the last talk medical solutions to the osteoporotic fractures please sir go ahead good evening sir am i audible Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, first of all, I like to uh, thank my TNOA president and uh, secretary uh, 
as well as uh, <coughs> MOA President and Secretary for nominating me uh, to give a lecture uh, among this uh, August body. It's a privilege to uh, <coughs> it's a privilege to share share the session uh, with uh, our own teacher uh, Professor G S Kulkarni sir. Uh, this is this is the last talk uh, after a <laughs> comprehensive and extensive uh, lectures on surgical management of osteoporotic fracture. We are coming to the medical solution to osteoporotic fracture. They are not under our concern. Uh, this to be dealt by the physicians. But I feel uh, every youngster uh, should have a basic idea about the uh, medical management of osteoporotic fracture because we are going to see more and more number of cases uh, in the near future. So <coughs> it's a modern pandemic. The osteoporosis is a silent modern pandemic. It is sweeping across all continents irrespective of countries, race and life pattern. Still, it is not given proper weight, weightage in the non-communicable disease pattern. Let us see the <coughs> prevalence statistics. An estimated 200 million people worldwide are suffering from this silent pandemic. Worldwide osteoporosis causes more than 8.9 million fractures annually. And osteoporotic fractures occurs every 3 seconds worldwide. 1 in 3 women over the age of 50 will experience osteoporotic fractures in her lifetime. Majority of individuals who had already had at least one fracture are neither identified nor treated. In women over 45 years of age, osteoporosis account for more days in hospital than any other disease including diabetes, myocardial infarction and breast cancer. In India, an unestimated 50 million women have osteoporosis. The projection is very alarming. Men will be having more than 320% increase in hip fracture, whereas women will be having more than 240% increase in hip fracture by the year 2040. And it is going to produce an enormous cost burden on the whole world. So, is it possible to diagnose osteoporosis before the occurrence of fragility fracture? I doubt it's not possible because it's a silent disease until complicated by fracture so how are you going to diagnose postmenopausal osteoporosis there are only two ways you have to wait until there is occurrence of fragility fracture or you go for measurement of bone mineral density so the clinical feature there is no clinical manifestation until there is fracture multiple fracture is the most common clinical manifestation of osteoporosis again most of these fractures are asymptomatic they are diagnosed as an incidental finding on chest or abdominal x-ray. So, when you are going to the history, the symptoms, the osteoporosis symptoms are very non-specific and vague. The fracture symptoms, the vertebral fracture will be having no symptoms, whereas the hip and forearm fracture will be presenting with pain and deformity. So, immediately after history, you look into the risk factors for osteoporosis as well as for fragility fracture. These are the risk factors for low BMD as well as osteoporosis fracture. The point to be noted is the risk factor for osteoporotic fracture are not the same as that for the low BMD. Immediately after that, we look into the secondary cause of osteoporosis and rule it out. As Professor Vikas, as Dr. Vikas was discussing, these are all the commonest causes of secondary causes of osteoporosis. After that, you go for physical examination. First point to be noted is what are the factors suggestive of increased fracture risk that include the impaired ambulation, muscle weakness, impaired balance, reduced vision and orthostatic hypotension. Then you have to go for signs of prior undiagnosed fracture that can be diagnosed by looking into loss of height, presence of kyphosis, chest deformity, rib pelvis overlap and protuberant abdomen. The two important Useful signs for erecting osteoporosis include wall occipital distance of more than 0 cm and rib pelvic overlap of less than 2 finger breadth. These are two important useful signs for erecting osteoporosis. So, over 95% of time it is the fragility fracture, especially the non vertebral fracture which brings the patient to the clinical scenario. Again, the type of fall affects the fracture site. If it is a young people, they have intact protective mechanism, they fall on hand and sustain forearm fracture. Whereas a relatively old patient, they have compromised protective mechanism, they fall on site and sustain a hip fracture. So I heard about vertebral fracture, <coughs> occurrence of 5.5 million per year. Again, a vertebral fracture, fracture is a marker for future fracture risk. 
it occurs with activities of daily living like lifting pushing and pulling only 25 percent of vertebral fracture seen on x-ray are diagnosed clinically so what are the consequences of vertebral fracture persistence of back pain loss of height deformities reduced pulmonary function and diminished quality of life what about hip fracture 1.5 1.6 millions per year occurrence again hip fracture is a marker for future fracture risk most are caused by fall from standing height most are diagnosed clinically confirmed with x-ray and hospitalized for surgery as, as, as compared to vertebral fracture so what is the consequence up to 25 percent excess mortality within one year 50 percent of hip fracture survivors are permanently incapacitated 25 20% of hip fracture survivors require long term nursing care and 20 times the cost of management of vertebral fracture when compared to hip fracture. So, apart from occurrence and diagnosis of fragility fracture, the only other way to diagnose osteoporosis is measuring the BMT. So, let us have some important points regarding this BMT. So, what are the indications for bone densitometry? We have to know the indications clearly. The first indication is all postmenopausal women less than 60 years of age with additional risk factor. All women with more than 60 years of age, with regardless of additional risk factor, documenting reduced bone density in patient with vertebral fracture on X-ray to monitor the efficacy of interventions and documenting low bone density in secondary causes of osteoporosis. These are all the five common indications for bone densitometry. So, we all know it can be done in central as well as in appendicular skeleton. These are all the various methods of uh, doing uh, uh, bone densitometry. The commonly followed one is the DEXA scan. We all know. So it is used as a diagnostic, prognostic and monitoring purpose for clinical utility. This is the way to measure the hip as well as the spine <laughs> BMD. We all know how to interpret the DEXA scan. So what are the factors which decides the prevalence of osteoporosis? The first and foremost factor is the definition given by the WHO for low bone mass and the technique used for densitometry, the site of bone selected as well as the study population. These are all the factors which decide the prevalence of osteoporosis. What are the contraindications for DEXA scan? Pregnancy, recent contract study, recent nuclear medicine scan, extensive orthopedic instrumentation and when the body weight is greater than the table limit. These are all the contraindications for doing central DEXA scan. Is there any role for peripheral measurement? Because of high cost and lack of portability of DEXA, other techniques up to measure peripheral sites have been developed. But the WHO criteria for diagnosis of osteoporosis do not apply to these other technologies. So it is used in clinical scenario for only for screening purpose and not useful at all for quantitating osteoporosis and follow-up study. So why you have chosen a score of minus 2.5 as the cutoff? Because such a cutoff value identify approximately 30% of postmenopausal women as having osteoporosis by measurement and this is equivalent to the lifetime risk of fracture. That's why the score of minus 2.5 is selected. Uh, what is the advantage of T-score measurement over the measurement of BMD? BMD gives absolute insight into the bony architecture, but multiple devices exist that use different approaches to BMD measurement for different skeletal skeletons. So the T-score provides a way, a way of using the same diagnostic criteria for all devices and, and as well as for all skeletal site. What is the importance of Z score and T score? Z score is a comparison of patient's BMD to age matched population, whereas T score is the comparison between a patient's BMD and that of young adult reference population. So the T Z score should over would overscore the prevalence of BMO. So it is mainly used for research purpose in children and in men as well as in diagnosing secondary osteoporosis. For all other postmenopausal women, we have to go by T score only. So what are the caveats of diagnosis based on BM, BMD? The diagnosis of osteoporosis by DEXA is based on WHO classification of T-score of minus 2.5 or below. But that is doesn't mean some patients with T-score of minus 2.5 or below uh, do not have osteoporosis. Some patients with T-score above minus 2.5 may be diagnosed with osteoporosis. The T-score value differ in different skeletal sites. Diagnosis of osteoporosis does not explain etiology at all. Patient with a diagnosis of osteoporosis may have substantially different fracture risk. So what are the limitations of WHO classification? It is not intended for treatment guidelines. The definition do not necessarily apply to other population. It does not recognize that a presumptive diagnosis of osteoporosis can be made even by a low energy trauma like fragility fracture regardless of the BMD and this it does not differentiate between osteoporosis and other causes of low BMD. 
uh, frax it was uh, clearly uh, discussed in detail by our, by my pr previous speaker dr sanjay so i'm go I'm, i'm skipping this uh, uh, we have to go for initial blood panel most of the time it is uh, within normal limits the importance of blood chemistry is to look for secondary causes of osteoporosis as was uh, discussed in detail in case discussion these are all the various tests available uh, for ruling out secondary causes of osteoporosis <laughs> so important one is bone turnover markers these these are all products of bone remodeling they are all non invasive easily repeatable but it is an independent risk factor for fracture it cannot diagnose osteoporosis so it is mainly used for, for monitoring response to treatment what are the markers there are markers of bone resorption that include n telopeptide and c telopeptide and markers of bone formation that include bone specific alkaline phosphatase and p1np so how are you going to monitor the treatment what are the challenges in front of us the goals of treatment is to reduce the occurrence of fragility fracture but the absence of fragility fracture without therapy does not necessarily mean treatment is ineffective occurrence of fracture on therapy does not necessarily indicate treatment failure so you have to always supplement with surrogates like bmt and biochemical marker to monitor the progress of the <coughs> improvement of the disease so why you have to go for serial measurement of bmt in untreated patient if there is significant loss it is an indication for starting the treatment in treated in treated patient you have to monitor the response so how are you going to monitor always compare apple with apple you always compare the bmt score not the t score what is the significant of difference how are you going to interpret the difference for all that you have to do the study in the same center by the same machine the center should have performed and documented precision errors and least significant change with the system because the bmd values for different dexa manufacturers are not comparable for this following reasons so how much the difference in bmd is real you have to uh, precision error in lsc should be measured and documented you have to subtract the current bmd from the previous one if it matches or exceeds the lsc then the change is significant let us see one example here is a lady 65 years old lady 2016 value is and 2018 value are given the difference is minus 0.034 which is more than the lsc so the change is significant we have to consider the <coughs> other causes of osteoporosis so the patient should be encouraged to return to the same center for follow up scans but you only have to remember that the central dexa is is to be preferred over peripheral densitometry for assessment and follow up and should never consider peripheral densitometry as a measure of quantifying the osteoporosis so what is the interpretation stable or increasing bmd is associated with the reduction in fracture risk for sure whereas if there is decreases is a significant decrease in bmd over the years it is an worrisome factor you have to check for compliance with medication check for calcium and vitamin d intake look for underlying disease and condition so what is the management of osteoporosis proper the medical management the guidelines given by national osteoporosis foundation and north american menopause society and american academy of clinical endocrinologists so what is the management protocol what it say in spite of high mortality morbidity and economic cost osteoporosis is often often untreated and this trend is getting worse and worse in all world countries despite advances in diagnosis and therapy most patient with osteoporosis receives no evaluation or treatment even after sustaining a fragility fracture what is the woman perception i would rather take chance with my broken bone rather than take risk that comes with the drugs that is the common woman perception especially in india so you have to need to balance with the risk versus benefit these are all the common risk associated with <coughs> osteoporosis medical management and these are all the common benefits you can come across with the osteoporosis medical management uh, uh, concept of fracture liaison service is getting more and more popular, popular in western countries it's a team based approach which identifies the patient with fracture and stratify them and initiate treatment and follow up the outcome with the importance being given to ncd by the government this protocol would come into work in near future in in a, in a short period of time in india also so exercise we all know exercise is going to improve the bmd so exercise is the, is the first line of management for osteoporosis calcium it's been given in detail by previous speakers the only point is we have to add vitamin k27 for better absorption the calcium supplement may increase vascular risk this this is this is conflicting reports cannot be assured or documented so calcium should be given as a simple first step in promoting bone health 
these are all some of the calcium rich diet vitamin d vitamin d is persistent low values worldwide in all population there is a gross decline in exposed to sun all over the world uh, as the age progresses the skin become less effective as a source again the dietary intake is getting lower and lower as the age progresses this low level of vitamin d predisposes to osteoporosis always maintain a value of 20 nanogram or above I, in a postmenopausal woman, we have to give go for 80, 800 unit rather than 400 nanosh unit. These are all some of the sources of vitamin D. So, what is an ideal drug for osteoporosis? The ideal drug should increase bone mass to improve it. In, it should improve bony architecture and strength. At the same time, it it should reduce the risk of fracture. Unfortunately, none of the drugs presently available are fulfilling all the three criteria. We can classify the group of drugs into two broad group, one is anti receptor group, other one is anabolic group. This is the clinical management of PMO evaluation over the years and this is the management protocol with uh, bisphosphonate in the management of osteoporosis over the years. So the anabolic uh, agent that is the teriparatide and the anti receptor agent that is the bisphosphonate acts entirely in a different way in, uh, in managing the postmenopausal osteoporosis and improving the Bone, mar bone mineral density. This is the way they act. Uh, this is the treatment algorithm followed in western countries for the management of osteoporosis. They start with HRT and, uh, and as the age progresses they slowly switch over to relaxifan, bisphosphonate and parathormone. <laughs> well, this is an important slide. Uh, this is the MT FDA indication for osteoporosis of various drugs. If you notice uh, it is this, uh, for both for postmenopausal osteoporosis as well as for steroid induced osteoporosis as well as for men. If you notice, you can see the zolantonic acid is the only one, only one drug which fulfills all the five ticks. So because uh, so that is the only drug which can be given for all kind of osteoporosis. So what is the global consensus statement on menopausal hormone therapy? It is stated that it is effective and appropriate for the prevention of osteoporosis related fracture in at risk women below the age of 60 years or within 10 years of menopause but the point to be noted is estrogen used in osteoporosis would be off label only we will go to the drug one by one first one is the relaxifan it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator it has a significant increase in bmd both in spine and hip the bone turnover markers are decreased it reduces vertebral fracture but there is no proven benefit for hip or other fracture the extra skeletal consideration include it reduces the breast cancer but does not stimulate the endometrium thereby preventing the endometrial carcinoma but it, it does not have any role in preventing heart flushes, DVT and cramps. The bisphosphonates is an important group. It is anti receptive It increases bone mineral density at various bone sites. The bone turnover markers are grossly reduced. It reduces risk of all fracture. The extra skeletal consideration include the specific dosing requirement, GAT irritation, musculoskeletal pain, very rarely atypical femoral fracture, osteonecrosis of jaw and hypocalcemia. These are all some of the common possible side effects of bisphosphonate. The important bisphosphonate is zolondronic acid. It is the most potent bisphosphonate available at present. It increases BMD at the spine by 4 to 5 percent and at the hip by 3 to 3.5 5 percent as compared to placebo. Over, the, over three years of period, it reduces the incidence of spine fracture by 70% and hip fracture by 40% and non ventibral fracture by 25%. Nasal calcitonin, it is a biological agent. There is a slight increase in BMD. The bone turnover markers are reduced. It reduces the risk of ventibral fracture, but there is no proven benefit in hip or other fracture. The exoskeletal consideration include nasal irritation, possible analgesic effect and no known drug interaction with any other drug. Teriparatide is the important uh, <laughs> drug uh, to be noted. It is the only anabolic drug available. Uh, the, it increases BMD in spine and hip. The bone turnover markers are contrastingly increased when compared to other drugs. Uh, fracture, it reduces the vertebral fracture and other fracture. Again, there is no proven benefit for hip fracture. The concerns include the uh, reporting of osteosarcoma in rats, daily subcutaneous injection, the requirement of refrigeration, development of hypocalcemia, leg cramps, dizziness and cost factor and another important point is it should not be used for more than two years as a therapeutic substance. Strontium ranulate, it resembles and mimics calcium in action, it participates in bone mineralization but it has very potent cardiovascular complication so its use is restricted only as a second line therapy for osteoporosis. Denosumab, it is the latest one, it is anti-receptive, monopolon antibody, it inhibits rankle, rankle receptors 
comprehensively it increases bmd in all areas the bone turnover markers are uh, decreased it is the only drug which reduces the vertebral hip and other fractures uh, when compared to other drugs but the bmd declines on stoppage of treatment again extra cellular consideration include hypocalcemia infection and osteonecrosis of jaw so can we consider drug holiday if osteoporosis is mild for treatment with bisphosphonate a drug holiday of 1 to 2 years can be given after 4 to 5 years of stability if osteoporosis is severe a drug holiday of 1 to 2 years can be given after 10 years of stability this is the algorithm for giving drug holiday for osteoporotic patient uh, this is a questionnaire based uh, drug holiday if the answer all the answers are in green we can very well give a drug holiday if the, all the answers are in red then we should not go for a drug holiday what about combination therapy it's a newer and rational approach as mono drug therapy does not always restore bmd and prevent all fracture so what are the possible modes bisphosphonate followed by parathormone bisphosphonate along with parathormone and parathormone followed by bisphosphonate let us see one by one the more potent the bisphosphonate to reduce the bone turnover the greater is the delay in the subsequent pth response but ultimately most patient response to pth irrespective of the bisphosphonate use so it can be recommended parathormone should always be followed by uh, bisphosphonate because parathormone being an anabolic drug if it is not followed by antiresorptic drug then bone density rapidly falls and there is no proven benefit for simultaneous use of parathormone with bisphosphonate so in summary bisphosphonate followed by parathormone a delay in bmd may occur but eventually overcome a combination therapy of bisphosphonate and parathormone are not recommended as of now parathormone usage should always be followed by bisphosphonate this is the summary for combination therapy so what is the definition for osteoporotic treatment failure there are three points one is occurrence of two or more incident fragility fracture on treatment one incident fragility fracture and elevated bone turnover markers at baseline and so no significant reduction during treatment or significant decrease in bmd and no significant decrease in serum bone turnover markers and significant decrease in bmd these are all three indication which should be considered as osteoporotic treatment failure what are you going to adapt a weaker anti receptive drug is to be replaced by a more, more potent drug of the same class an oral drug is to be replaced by an injectable drug a strong anti receptive drug is to be replaced by an anabolic drug so we are going to see only two two case clinical case scenario one one case is already being in, discussed in detail by uh, dr rikasha uh, this is a 50 years 55 years old male sorry female with a history of muscle ache over left arm there is a monopausal history of 5 years back no history of fragility fracture no history of height loss maternal history of hip fracture regular exercise regular calcium intake there is a past history of cholecystectomy is there any indication for you buffer bmt measurement yes absolutely because menopause with one additional risk factor this are all the bmt value the spine t score is minus 4.5 is it a post menopausal osteoporosis no uh, the bmo uh, post menopausal osteoporosis is of this severity is unusual at this age go for additional history uh, on additional probing flat lens occurring during regular uh, for a long period intermittent diarrhea diffuse muscle pain and bone pain so further investigation revealed there is a mal absorption syndrome with the secondary hyperparathyroidism you have to manage that there is no need for other drugs the second case mr mrs 67 67 year old female diagnosed as post menopausal osteoporosis uh, and was on bisphosphonate therapy for 2 years baseline score was minus 2.5 after 2 years it is minus 3.4 the interpretation is there is a significant decrease in bmd over the 2 years therapy so you have to evaluate the whether the patient is entering uh, adhering to the therapy and you have to look for secondary causes on further investigation there it was found to be a multiple myeloma with a secondary osteoporosis so what is the conclusion significant decrease in bmd on therapy is always a great great concern always look for dexa accuracy and whether the patient is adhering to the medical management if not if all these are correct then you have to look for secondary causes of osteoporosis and this is the final algorithm for broad management of medical management of osteoporosis uh, everyone should know about uh, should know the concept of medical management of osteoporosis i have to everyone has to follow this algorithm so where are we now we have some good news there are improved awareness excellent diagnostic tools are available safe and effective individualized treatment as available better understanding of pathogenesis the government initiative to improve care has become initiated 
what are the bad news under recognition of patient at risk for fracture decreasing access to dexa poor patient understanding of risk and benefit fewer fewer patients are given treatment and poor adherence to treatment these are all the bad news the the end note post menopausal osteoporosis is to be considered as a modern world epidemic can result in devastating physical psychosocial and economic consequences it is often overlooked and undertreated a planned approach to prevent osteoporosis and also the timely diagnosis of this chronic disease prevent disabling consequences thereby reducing the burden on the society as a whole i thank you for your patient hearing thank you very much sir for this uh, informative and lucid presentation M many of the things uh, we came to know first time uh, through this presentation and it was very informative about uh, the medical management of osteoporosis i am thank you very much uh, our mmc observer dr chaugule has joined welcome dr chaugule for this activity we have conducted this from 5 to 8 pm uh, according to the mmc guidelines 3 3 uh, hours of the activity we have taken uh, i welcome dr chaugule is from kolapur uh, so i welcome dr chaugule for this activity do you want to talk anything uh, dr chaugule so thank you very much is there any question or anything uh, to the speakers about today's talks i think this was an elaborate discussion on osteoporosis and orthopedics next time we are uh, particularly uh, going to talk on the spine spine and osteoporosis so that will again a uh, very informative talk uh, we are uh, the partner uh, in the next this is up upoa uttar pradesh orthopedic association and it will definitely be a uh, good webinar again so i request all of you to join for the uh, next webinar also and i am thankful to all of you especially speakers dr sangeet gawale sir dr gs kulkarni sir vikas agashe sir dr balaji asegaukar all the speakers from tamil nadu president and secretary of tamil nadu orthopedic association president and secretary of maharashtra and of course dr ram chadda organizing secretary of iocon i am thankful to all of you for attending this webinar and uh, making this a grand success thank you very much so shall we take the leave thank you sir thank you yeah thank you bye uh, thank you very much sir thank, thank you yeah, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone bye. thank you thank you